What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to What If Zoro Was Reborn and JJK as Toji's Son. Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Join my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. When Zoro woke up, warmth enveloped his body, as if someone had been hugging him until just a moment ago. For the first time in a while, Zoro woke up early and watched the sun rise from the window of their lodging. As he watched the red sun rise from the black sea, Sumiki woke up behind him, looking tousled. Zoro turned to Sumiki, who smiled sleepily. Ah, it's brother. Did you have a good dream? Yeah. Indeed, it was a good dream. Back in Tokyo, Zoro bought white flowers. Knowing where Zoro was going with the flowers, Toji kept silent. Since Zoro couldn't be sent off alone, Toji, as before, drove him to the cemetery. At the entrance to the cemetery, Toji, leading Zoro, caught a glimpse of Cher's grave in the distance and abruptly stopped. Gasping for breath, Toji covered his face with his palms, turning away from the tombstone, and managed to utter, Sorry, sorry. He thought he had gotten much better. He thought he was really okay now. But the moment he saw that person's tombstone, all that complacency shattered instantly. Next time, next time, I'll definitely go with you. Toji sincerely promised. Without reprimanding him, Zoro simply nodded calmly. Okay? Wait here. Leaving Toji behind, Zoro walked on. Finding a place with water and a bucket, he scooped up water with the bucket and brought it over. After wandering among several tombstones, Zoro finally stopped in front of Cher's grave. He poured the water he had brought over the tombstone, washing it clean. Then, Zoro placed the modest bouquet of flowers he had brought in front of Cher's grave. For a while, Zoro said nothing. Then, suddenly, he spoke. Yesterday, I saw Mother in my dream. Whether it was a dream, a memory, or if he really met Cher, he wasn't sure. Zoro's intuition came last. As soon as the question of how arose, something came to mind. A curse or a spell? Like the Devil Fruits, a power unique to this world that makes the impossible possible. It seemed like Cher had used it. It might have been someone else who cursed Zoro. But if that were the case, there would be no reason for Cher to appear in his dreams. If the intent had been to harm, Zoro would have noticed it long ago. Whether it was a curse or a spell, I don't really care. But if the person he met in his dream was really Cher, there was something Zoro wanted to say. Cher had said a lot about being grateful and sorry in the dream. While the former could be understood, the latter couldn't just be overlooked. There's nothing for Mother to be sorry about. Whatever she did, whatever happened, Cher doesn't need to apologize to Zoro. Because I was okay. The world changed, life completely transformed, and he became a baby. But it wasn't bad. It was comfortable enough and filled with love. Chia and Toji made it so. Things were tough after Chia died and Toji left. But now, it's okay. Toji has returned, Megumi is growing up well. And though not by blood, he even has a younger sister now. Things will only get better from here. As for being happy. Honestly, I'm not sure. But I can assure you that I'm not unhappy. So if you're staying because of me, you don't have to. Whether it's because you're sorry, worried, or because you love me, you can leave now. I'm strong, and I'll get even stronger. I'll become the undisputed strongest in this world. I won't lose to anyone, I'll protect what I want to protect, and cut down what I wish to cut. You don't have to worry anymore. You can rest in peace. I'm really okay. Thank you. I love you. Zoro closed his eyes and placed his palms together in front of his chest praying for the peace and enlightenment of the person who loved him and whom he loved. The sound of waves could be heard. Just as footprints left on the sand are washed away, something quietly departed. After that day, Zoro no longer dreamed. What's with you? Did you manifest a spell? Your energy seems a bit diminished. Gorjo Satoru, meeting Zoro again after a long time at Jujutsu High, frowned upon seeing him. Gorjo took off his sunglasses and closely inspected Zoro with his six eyes. After scrutinizing him from up close, he exclaimed, Ah, it wasn't energy, but a curse so weak it could almost be mistaken for energy. Whatever it was, it's completely lifted now. What? Toji was startled and hugged Zoro tightly. You should have told me from the start if the kid had a curse. What's the use of having those great six eyes? It resembled his energy, both in type and nature, and they were mixed together. If I can mistake a curse for energy, it means the curse was incomplete, weak, and barely a curse at all. It wouldn't have any effect on an ordinary non-sorcerer anyway. You should ease up on the overprotection. Well, if the person cursed had actively succumbed to it, it might have been a different story. But even then, it couldn't have had a long-term impact. At most, it would have affected them once or twice. That's what Gorjo thought. Toji murmured palely, what kind of curse was it? How would I know? It's already been lifted. Useless guy. Hey listening to their bickering, Zoro thought to himself. So it was a curse placed by Chia, after all. Since it's been lifted, she must have truly left for good now. That was a relief. Within Toji's embrace, Zoro, who had been quietly contemplating, was turned to face him directly. Have you experienced anything strange recently? I let her go. Let go. What? Who? Chia. Toji's arms, which had been tenderly wrapped around Zoro's back, froze. Gorjo, unaware of the situation, just blinked. 
whose chair. Zoro didn't answer Gorjo's question. Now wasn't the time for that. Unlike him, Toji wasn't okay yet. He didn't want to reopen wounds, but he had to explain. Zoro spoke calmly. Death is just that death. If she's lingering where she shouldn't be, then she should be let go. So, I let her go. Wow, Zoro, you lifted a curse. You're like a real sorcerer. Shut up. Can't he see the situation? Or is he pretending not to know? I'll have to cut him down later. Zoro glanced briefly at Gorjo. Toji remained silent, motionless. However, Zoro could tell that inside Toji's usually expressionless face, a storm of intense emotions was raging. Reason and emotion don't always move in the same direction. Even if reason clearly dictates that a curse should be lifted, accepting it emotionally is another matter. Toji might resent not being told about such a significant act. Or he might have wished that even if it was a curse, it hadn't been lifted. Accepting the death of a loved one is always hard. Especially for Toji, who still couldn't properly face Chia's grave. Zoro sighed inwardly. Maybe it's better to keep some distance today. Being close might just make Toji angry. Knowing how annoying it can be to be reminded of what he's lost, Zoro was about to quietly slip away from Toji. That is, he would have if Toji hadn't grabbed his arm. So that's what happened. So it did. Toji repeated those words for a while. Your body is, it's fine. After all, even if it was a curse, Chair wouldn't have left something that would harm Zoro. When did you lift it? I don't know. Probably the day I went to the grave. Right. You did well. Not sure if it was just lip service, Toji. Closely observing Zoro who was watching him, gave a bitter smile. That chair had left a curse, and Zoro had lifted it was indeed a shock to Toji as well. But he didn't want to blame Zoro for it. He just did what had to be done. Although Zoro said his body was fine, a curse is still a curse. If it could be lifted, then it was better to do so. Of course, towards chair too. What kind of curse it was, how it was lifted, whether he really met chair, if she had any messages for him. There were mountains of questions Toji wanted to ask but he found himself unable to ask any. Afraid that knowing more would make it impossible to let go. I have to let go. Both Toji and Chia. It was already too late. But now was the time to do so. Being stuck in the past only serves as a hindrance to those moving forward. If Zoro was the one who sent Chia off, Toji felt he could rest easy. She must be in a good place now. Although that means he would never meet her again, being doomed to hell himself, it was enough. In a low, trembling voice, Toji said, Thank you for sending your mother off properly. Toji slightly bowed his head. Zoro, looking up at Toji from within his embrace, gently wiped away the tears hidden beneath Toji's black hair with his hand. Hey, gorilla, are you crying? Despite Gorjo's incredulous question, Zoro didn't respond, continuing to wipe Toji's tears. They remained that way for a long while. Eventually, Toji raised his head with a composed face, and Zoro turned to face Gorjo who was still dumbfounded. Then, Zoro drew his sword from his waist. Now it's your turn. I'll give you a good slash. Question mark, question mark, question mark, why? Not knowing why, never mind, just come here. No way, you, no. I might get caught by a gorilla, but I'm not getting caught by a tiny moss ball like you. Toji laughed shortly and then stood up smoothly. You know you get caught by me. Ah, brace yourself. Today's training is going to be rough. Jito, who had gone out to look for Gorjo, witnessed from the forest Toji suddenly appearing in a flash and Gorjo running away with his eyebrows fluttering in the wind. Their eyes met as Toji sat on a tree branch. Reading Toji's lethal intent, Jito understood the message loud and clear. If you interfere, you'll end up like him. Jito quietly closed his eyes, thinking, I didn't see anything. I didn't see a thing. I should go back and write up a mission report. Spotting Jito turning away, Gorjo called out in desperation. Chichuyu, help me. Jito ignored Gorjo's cries and went back to the dormitory. Just as Gorjo had abandoned Jito to be beaten by Toji, and ran away before. After all, close friends tend to resemble each other. November passed, and December came. However, the common sense of reducing outdoor activities for students in winter did not apply in the Jujutsu world, where it was normal to exploit human labor and life to the fullest. Cold wind, low temperature, then wear clothes. But don't wear too much that it hinders you from eliminating curses. You might die otherwise. In the end, the students at the Jujutsu school just rolled around in a slightly colder state. The only silver lining was that winter had fewer curses than summer. Of course, it's not like the time spent at school without missions was entirely peaceful. Thwack. A wooden stick stabbed the ground where Gorjo Satoru's foot had just been. Looking at the small hole created by the stick's end, Gorjo swallowed nervously. Toji mockingly swung the stick swiftly at speeds that were invisible to the eye, and Gorjo panicked trying to defend himself. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, this crazy gorilla. Toji was furious for a simple reason. Yesterday, Megumi stuck his tongue out at Toji and went Ebibik at him. It was obvious he had learned it from. Seeing this, Zoro seriously scolded Megumi. Megumi, you shouldn't do that anytime you want. Provoking someone like that is something you do to an enemy or someone annoying. Shouldn't you teach him not to do it at all? My moss ball is strange. That's what Toji thought at the time. Of course, Gorjo, feeling wrong, pointed at Megumi, who was sitting next to Shoko drawing in a sketchbook. It was your sea urchin who did it. Why are you mad at me? So, I should scold my precious child instead. Wow, character that sea urchin. I won't let you off later. I'll thoroughly mess up your face. 
Gorjo gritted his teeth. Jito, already warm from being beaten up earlier, dusted off the dirt. It was sad to think that getting hit this much had become bearable. Meanwhile, Zoro was teaching Kendo to Tsumiki in a corner of the playground. You need to hold the grip properly. Like this. A bit lower than that. Here. Yeah. The bamboo sword was too heavy for Tsumiki to swing, so they bought a plastic toy sword from the mart. Although it was ridiculously short, light, and crude compared to a real bamboo sword or a Japanese sword, it was suitable for starting. Holding the toy sword, Sumiki's brown eyes sparkled with seriousness and passion. Seeing this, Zoro knew he had something important to say to Tsumiki as a swordsman. Sumiki, yes. Do you really want to learn swordsmanship? Having reincarnated into this world, Zoro had also learned a bit about this world's kendo. Here, kendo had long become a sport with established rules rather than for practical combat. It makes sense. In this world, there was no swordsmanship, martial arts, haki, or devil fruits that could change the course of battle to an astonishing degree. Whether it truly didn't exist, had existed but now disappeared, or still existed but remained hidden was unclear. With a fundamental limit to how strong a human could become, the only option was to advance technology and increase the level of weapons and the number of troops. Curses are different, but only Jujutsu sorcerers born with cursed energy can use them. And even those sorcerers were very few in number. Just looking at the student count of Tokyo Jujutsu High made it evident. There were only three first-year students, Gorjo, Jito, and Yeri, no second-year students, one third-year, Yudam Yori, one fourth fourth year, May May, and two fifth years. At first, I thought this country was like the East Blue, a peaceful area. But it wasn't. Japan was equivalent to the New World in the latter half of the Grand Line, a place with the most curses and Jujutsu sorcerers in the entire world of my previous life. And yet, this is it. Honestly, it was somewhat disappointing. When Zoro asked why there were so few students, Gorjo scoffed. Hey, originally Jujutsu sorcerers are super super rare. Normally, it's common for about two to enroll per grade in Jujutsu High, three if it's a lot. Sometimes there's only one, or even none at all. As Gorjo wiped the blood from his lip from getting beaten by Toji, he said irritably, not every Jujutsu Sorcerer enrolls here. There was supposed to be one second year candidate, but they were from a Jujutsu Sorcerer family and chose not to enroll. There are two in the fifth year, but they're hardly ever at school because they're always out on missions. Right now, there's only one teacher at Tokyo Jujutsu High, Yaga-sensei. That's few. Laughable. You think this is the Heian period, where Jujutsu Sorcerers are everywhere. Heian period. It's the golden age of curses. The time when Ryom and Sukuna, the King of Curses, ran rampant. About 1200 to 800 years ago from now, the King of Curses. Zoro stored that name in his memory as Gorjo casually put his sunglasses back on. Well, it's true there aren't many Jujutsu Sorcerers. In the past dozen years, the curses that were dormant have started to become active again. The damage caused by curses is also increasing. Satoru stomped his feet in frustration. That's why we need to make that gorilla from your house a Jujutsu Sorcerer as soon as possible, so our workload decreases. What the hell are those old farts doing? We've sent how many reports cursing the illiterate damned old folks, Gorjo Gojo's rant was pushed aside as Zoro continued his thoughts. This world doesn't really need swordsmanship. This country is peaceful, and the level of weapons has far surpassed the limits of human strength. The only thing that could potentially bridge that gap curses is available to too few people, and Jujutsu sorcerers don't really interfere with non-sorcerers. As a result, this world's battles and wars were led more by the level of weapons, the number of troops, and logistical capabilities, rather than individual prowess. Naturally, swordsmanship remained only as a sport, such as fencing or kendo. There were still swordsmanship styles that involved tripping and grappling, which had practical elements, but they weren't truly about killing. However, what Zoro will teach Tsumiki from now on is different. A sword is fundamentally a deadly weapon. The swordsmanship I will teach involves wielding that weapon to harm lives. It's fine if she learns kendo as a sport. That generally won't result in harming people, and Zoro can teach just at that level. But if she learns real swordsmanship, she must be prepared to harm others. Honestly, Zoro didn't clearly understand that fact when he chose the path of a swordsman. However, by the time he did, he had already resolved to become the strongest swordsman and never thought of fleeing, which makes his situation different from Sumiki's. Sumiki is young and kind. She's not a sorcerer, nor has she started walking the path of a swordsman early like Zoro. Her age and personality don't fit learning and training to harm people with a sword. Yet, Zoro decided to teach her the sword because she desperately wanted it. Her small hand firmly grips the toy sword. Sumiki's sword was only shaped like a sword, essentially a toy. It had no blade and was made of light plastic that would break and flop harmlessly if swung at someone. It couldn't kill a person. Yet, it felt cold and frightening. Despite that, Sumiki didn't let go of the sword's handle. I don't want to hurt anyone. Not anyone. Just want to play with Megumi. Then I want to be with you. Stopped by her earnest voice, Zoro paused. At that moment, Sumiki could see nothing in the darkness. Even if there had been light, she wouldn't have seen anything. Because she was different from the other three, not wanting to harm anyone wasn't a lie. She wanted to spend time playing with Megumi, Zoro, and the uncle. But without knowing anything, being together was no different from being infinitely apart. Zoro and the uncle are already in places Tsumiki 
doesn't know about. Eventually, Megumi will be, too. She wanted to see the same things. Walk the same path. Be together. If not, being together wouldn't really mean being together. Knowing the frustration of the weak, Zoro understood Sumiki. There are ways to become strong without the sword. But you use a sword, right? Yes. Then I want to do it with a sword too. Why? Because you're cool. Sumiki laughed brightly, and Zoro couldn't help but smile back. He gently ruffled Sumiki's hair. Tell me if it gets tough. Ah, I can't take it anymore. Far away. Gorjo, who had been jumping around, stopped dead with his eyes half turned. Ah, uh, ha! Huh. Sensing trouble, Zoro quickly scooped up Tsumiki and Megumi, and flew out of the playground. As he brushed past Jito and Shoko, he warned them. Hey, you guys better get out of here too. Thanks for the TIP Tilda Shoko instantly followed Zoro out of the playground. Left behind with Toji and Gorjo, Jito sensed a bad omen and tried to stop Gorjo. Wait, Satoru, maybe you should calm down a bit phase, Twilight. Hey! Hey, eyes of wisdom. It was the curse word of curse technique reversal. Blue. Having heard Gorjo's curse word a few times before, Jito panicked and summoned his cursed spirit, Red Dragon. He mounted it and flew over the playground shouting, Be careful, teacher. I can see perfectly well without you saying it, idiot. Toji thought, keeping his eyes fixed on Gorjo. Toji sent his observation haki towards a corner of the forest. Something caught his attention there. It was staring in this direction but did not move at all. Toji's lips twisted. Are you just going to watch? Well, it was what it was. Given the situation, and that couldn't make its own decision anyway. That guy probably didn't expect the young master to go this far. A full-powered limitless curse technique would just break it if it got involved. It seems I'll have to handle this on my own. Toji made up his mind neatly. Gorjo turned his wildly spinning eyes towards Toji and grinned wickedly. Move aside, gorilla. Even you won't be safe from this. Between Gorjo's hands, a searing blue energy moved along his touch. Curse technique reversal, maximum output. Blue. Whiz. Toji quickly dodged the swirling blue force with his observation haki. The vortex pursued Toji, pulling in and demolishing everything in its path. Crack, screech, rumble, bang. Dirt, grass, trees, stairs, gym equipment, and the track everything on the playground was shredded and sucked into the vortex. When the vortex subsided, only Gorjo and Toji were left standing. Toji glanced back at where the kids were and ground his teeth. Luckily, Zoro had stepped in on time, so no one was hurt but the playground was completely obliterated. Given the power, if caught, even Toji would have taken significant damage. It was the first time Gorjo had launched such a large-scale technique at Toji, with the intention to kill. This crazy guy, where did he learn that technique are you asking for a real fight, young master? Just what I wanted, gorilla. No more of that half-hearted physical training nonsense. Come at me for real. This is the real deal what's all this commotion. Returning from a four-hour external mission to his other battleground, the Tokyo Jujutsu High, Yaga Masamichi couldn't help but rub his eyes at the scene before him. There had been a playground here when he left for work, right? Yaga Masamichi looked at Toji. While the non-cursed user was undoubtedly powerful, he didn't possess a large-scale attack method that could wipe everything out in one go. More importantly, the residue of cursed energy was plastered all over. Then, the culprit is. Satoru, no Mr. Yaga. It was Aeawa. Whisk, Zoro whistled upon seeing the almost completely vanished playground. They really went all out. Knowing Toji's capabilities, he hadn't expected him to be defeated, but it was still astonishing. Thanks to this, I could have ended my life in a grand display. That homeroom teacher isn't too shabby. Huh? Zoro watched with interest as Gorjo Satoru was being dragged away by Yaga Masamichi. It looked exactly like catching a chicken. As Megumi peeked out, Zoro quietly covered his eyes. It wasn't time for his to see such things. Not yet. After turning Gorjo Satoru into a mess, Yaga Masamichi said he had something to discuss and led Toji to his own room. As soon as Yaga sat down, he deeply bowed his head towards Toji. I'm sorry. There's nothing for you to be sorry about to me. Yes, you're right. Toji looked down at Yaga, who trailed off with a look of pity. How did those two end up becoming teachers? Poor guy. Toji clicked his tongue. Toji's green eyes quickly scanned the room. While Yaga was unaware, it wasn't out of malice, but habit. He always checked his surroundings, identifying potential dangers wherever he went. Cotton balls and thread used for curse creation, jujutsu tools of unknown purpose, and piles of documents on the desk. And a framed photo of Yaga with a woman. That's my wife. Was. I staring for that long. Toji turned his gaze to Yaga expressionlessly. On Yaga's left ring finger was a plain gold ring without any pattern or gem. Married. Huh? Yes. It doesn't seem like you get to go home much. Missions, report writing, curse creation, teaching and guiding students. Yaga's daily routine was too predictable and bleak. Yaga smiled bitterly. It's because I'm a sorcerer. These past few years, we've especially been short on manpower. I wonder how long your wife can tolerate that. It must be hard to explain if she's not a sorceress. A sense of duty and responsibility as a sorcerer and teacher. Is that it? Toji couldn't understand since he had never felt such things. Is that a reason to give up on love? Just the love of chair alone was enough to overwhelm him, to sweep him away. Such a waste. 
Toji picked up the tea that Yaga had offered. As per the orders of the Jijutsu headquarters, I have been observing you until now. Toji stopped drinking his tea and slowly put down the teacup. You knew. I'm not an idiot, of course. I knew. You knew too, didn't you? That I knew. Yaga felt chills run down his spine as he met the sharp green eyes. Yaga himself hadn't paid much attention to the spas between Toji. Gorjo and Jito from a certain point onwards. But that didn't mean there weren't eyes on them. Because I had sent a cursed corpse there instead. On the sports field, in the forest, at the dormitory there was a cursed corpse watching Toji everywhere. It was the same just now. Just before Gorjo was about to launch a cursed energy spear. What Toji had noticed with his keen senses was one of Yaga's cursed corpses. Whether it was only set to observe or to react only when a student was severely injured, it didn't intervene just now. This one's quite unique too. The art of manipulating inanimate objects with cursed energy wasn't uncommon. However, someone like Yaga, who could produce cursed corpses en masse, was very rare. Even if Toji destroyed cursed corpses during training pretending not to know, Yaga would immediately send new ones. You have a good sense. Without cursed energy, I have to be good at something, right? Otherwise, wouldn't it be too unfair for me? Well, you wouldn't know since you've never lacked it. Toji sneered inwardly. So, you call me here to say you've been spying on me. Yaga silently drank his tea, wetting his throat, then spoke. The higher-ups have decided to acknowledge you as a sorcerer and assign you a grade. Silence fell. Toji spun his index finger around his temple. Are they crazy? Insane. Has the time finally come? The sorcerer killers, especially a monkey without any cursed energy, being recognized as a sorcerer by the old folks in the higher-ups. Yaga understood Toji's confusion. In fact, the higher-ups didn't even want to discuss Toji who lacked cursed energy. But this time, they had no choice. Satoru and Suguru recommended you as a grade 1 sorcerer. Toji's playful gesture paused. When? It was November 11th. It was Zoro's birthday. It was also the day when Toji definitely wouldn't have been at the Jujutsu High. I wondered why those two were grinding their teeth at each other recently. So they had this in mind. No matter how uncontrollable and irredeemable the kid was, Gorjo Satoru is the head of the Gorjo family. Given such a person recommended him as a grade 1 sorcerer, it would have been difficult for the higher-ups to completely ignore. Some sorcerers is strongly opposed, making it impossible for him to become a grade 1 sorcerer. But a grade will still be assigned. The grade is... Grade 4. Ha! Huh. Not sure if I should have expected just grade 4. Be astonished that a sorcerer killer who has killed many sorcerers has been accepted as a sorcerer. All laugh at the fact that he, he has been so dismissed for not having any cursed energy, was finally recognized as a sorcerer. So, what then? Probably you will work as a physical technique teacher at Tokyo Jujutsu High. You'll receive official missions as a sorcerer and teach students, like me. My kids, you can leave them at the high school or take them home. Honestly, the higher-ups were more than just troubled by the existence of Toji, who had zero cursed energy. They were at their wit's end. They didn't want to discuss the disposition of Zoro, a non-sorcerer child with powers similar to a sorcerer in this situation. Especially since Zoro was Toji's son. Ha! Huh. Haha really, they're going to do that. Toji couldn't help but burst into laughter. It was too absurd to bear. So, what about you? Do you think the same? Can you trust your students with me? The sorcerer killer who had been under surveillance by cursed corpses every day. Yaga looked down. He was originally known as a sorcerer killer. Even if he hadn't shown any malice towards the students so far, it was hard to be reassured. A sorcerer killer acted out of motive for money rather than grudges or personal beliefs. Just cooperating for now because our interests align. Yaga thought that a person who could become an enemy of the high school anytime their interests changed was a sorcerer killer. Ignoring him as if he didn't exist would make it impossible to designate Toji as a target in case of an emergency. Therefore, Yaga agreed to assigning Toji a grade, but he vehemently opposed the idea of him becoming a teacher responsible for protecting and guiding students. The issue wasn't his ability, but his character. However, somehow, Toji's appointment as a physical techniques teacher at Tokyo Jujutsu High passed incredibly quickly. What gave Yaga hope was the fact that the sorcerer killer he had heard of and the Zen and Toji he had experienced firsthand seemed to show somewhat different sides. It's a question I usually ask students who enroll in the high school. But given the circumstances, I dare to ask, why do you want to become a sorcerer? I'm not a sorcerer. What sorcerer without cursed energy? Let me rephrase the question. Why do you kill curses and assist sorcerers? Well, have I ever helped sorcerers? Even though he had killed sorcerers, Toji scoffed. Yaga shook his head in disagreement. From a certain point, you stopped healing sorcerers and started killing curses and cursed users. In the incident involving your son, the only people who died were the cursed users who were clearly involved in their groups protecting them. Non-sorcerers were punished according to the law, and sorcerers who were not clearly involved were not killed by you. Considering the past actions of a sorcerer killer, this was quite surprising. And now, although you are being paid, you cooperate with the headquarters investigations and teach students. Even when Satoru does something crazy, you have never attempted to kill him. Why? 
Toji didn't answer Yaga's question and turned his gaze out the window. In the distance, beyond the window, Megumi was playing tag, running wildly through the high school with Tsumiki and Zoro. Because I realized that shouldn't have been the case. The fundamental reason Toji had killed people in the past was ultimately inferiority. Because they was a sorcerer. Because they possessed cursed energy and techniques. He killed recklessly under the pretext of earning money. It was only after facing Megumi properly that he realized there should be no life that must die, just because it's considered blessed. Most sorcerers did nothing about his misfortune and bad luck, especially those who died by Toji's hand. As always, it was an enlightenment that came too late. That's why he didn't act against sorcerers without clear evidence during the investigation of the special Great Curse incident, and left non-sorcerers to be punished according to the law. Gorjo Satoru, too, was somewhat being spared. If he started killing because he had a hunch, because the law was too weak, or because that young master annoyed him, nothing would have changed. Just like when he killed sorcerers in the past, using money as an excuse for his vendetta. Do you regret it? I don't know. Regret? I'm not sure. It wouldn't change anything, after all. His hands are still stained with the blood of the innocent, and that can never be erased. But he was worried, not about Toji, but about the children who would be around Toji. Especially the most stubborn one. Toji sighed as he saw Zoro run off into some random forest during a game of tag. Do you know what happens when you have a son by your side? No matter what, I become afraid. Because I don't know how far my Marimo child would go for him. Marimos should just be comfortably in their aquariums. Marimos are supposed to roll around in the aquarium, playing with sea urchins, and when the time comes, just dive into the vast ocean together with the sea urchins. Not keep jumping out of the aquarium, getting covered in blood, and clinging uselessly to themselves. But that guy is too stubborn, grass and yet unnecessarily deeply emotional. Even for such a mess of a father, he doesn't take his eyes off him, and if he sits down defeated, he comes back and reaches out his hand. Even if Toji's place is hell, even if Zoro has to immerse himself in the flames of hell to come to Toji, that's why I'm trying to change. So that it's a little less hard for Zoro when he comes back to Toji. Yaga thought of the green-haired boy who always had two smaller children with him. He seemed quite ordinary for someone known to have soloed a special grade curse. Is it for the sake of being by that child's side? It was a somewhat precarious reason but still better than not having any at all. The former sorcerer killer didn't have such a line to begin with. Although it wasn't the most satisfactory answer, Toji's appointment as a teacher had already been decided. There was no choice but to accept it. Yaga bowed his head once again. Welcome to Jujutsu High, Mr. Zenin. Call me Mr. Toji. Mr. Zenin sounded like he was being treated the same as those old men, which he disliked. Ah, and about reverse curse technique. Yes. How good are your reverse curse technique skills? Why do you ask those guys? I think I need to kill them once. Excuse me, Toji recalled Gorjo Satoru, who had just been chanting a spell and launching his maximum output, Cursed Technique Lapse. Blue. They think they can beat me if they use their techniques and go all out, so they pull such stunts. He needed to make sure they wouldn't even think of doing such a thing again, both of them. It would make teaching them in the future easier. Since there was a reverse curse technician around, he was thinking of killing them once. Toji smirked menacingly. Seeing that smirk, Yaga thought that maybe he should have opposed Toji's appointment as a teacher at Jujutsu High, with his life on the line. Zen and Toji. Grade 4 Sorcerer. Physical Techniques Teacher at Tokyo Jujutsu High. Toji idly looked at the faculty ID card Yaga had issued him for Jujutsu High, casually tossing it into the air and catching it. Today was the day Zen and Toji would start his first day at Jujutsu High as both a teacher and a sorcerer. Uncle, I want to try that too. Despite the early hour, Sumiki's eyes sparkled as she reached out to Toji. When Toji handed her the ID card, Sumiki threw it towards the ceiling and caught it again. After finishing morning training and coming out of the bath, Zoro saw Tsumiki throwing and catching the ID card like a throwing star and asked, What's that? My ID card from Jujutsu High. Hum. Zoro responded nonchalantly and shook his damp green hair. Toji watched him with a peculiar look. The wetness made him look even more like a Marimo. Zoro came over to Toji and deftly caught the ID card Sumiki had thrown in the wrong direction. Glancing at the ID card, Zoro pointed to the part that read grade 4. What's this? It's the grade. Grade? Sorcerers and curses each have their own grades. From special grade, then from grade 1 to grade 4. So grade 4 is the strongest. Toji chuckled at Zoro's innocent question. No. Then, special grade is the strongest. Then comes grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4. Like that. Well, there are things like semi-grade 1 2 Toji suddenly realized how unaware Zoro was about such knowledge. It was to be expected since he was still young, but it seemed like he needed to be educated. Should I have him sit in on some classes at Jujutsu High? With so few students, he probably couldn't sneak in even if he wanted to. So should he just send him openly? Toji thought amusingly. Zoro frowned. Grade 4 is the weakest. Yes, but dad is grade 4. Because I have no cursed energy, they probably didn't know how to assign a grade. The grading of sorcerers considers the ability to utilize cursed energy and the effectiveness of their techniques. In truth, they probably didn't even want to assign a grade at all. Toji thought to himself. Of course, they would still assign him missions that grade 1 sorcerers take on. That's how it is. 
Zoro clicked his tongue in disapproval. Idiots. Toji gazed thoughtfully at his eldest son. A few days ago, when Toji had told Zoro that he would officially become a sorcerer and start working at Jujutsu High, Zoro had listened quietly, and then asked just one thing. Is that what you wanted? Yes. Then it's fine. That was the end of it. Zoro didn't ask any more. Is it indifference, or does he just trust that I'll handle it well? Probably both. Zoro was fundamentally indifferent to others, and didn't meddle much. Although he cared deeply, he wasn't the type to scrutinize what others were doing or take an interest in their every action. In Toji's view, Zoro fundamentally let others do as they wished until they encountered a specific situation where he would step in. This included situations where protection was needed, when someone couldn't or wasn't doing what they needed to, or when they were doing something they shouldn't. Zoro pays attention to me often because I frequently find myself in such situations. Toji smiled bitterly. He couldn't deny it, and that made him feel sorry. Of course, just because Zoro seemed to brush things off didn't mean Toji could really leave him uninformed. So, Toji did explain more to Zoro. He talked about how missions usually involve capturing curses or cursed users, how Zoro, Sumiki, and Megumi would stay at Jujutsu High with Toji while he was teaching, and how, if Toji was on a long mission, they might have to wait at the school dormitory with their siblings, or stay at home with the babysitter among other things. I don't plan to take on long missions anyway. Zoro gets lost if he walks more than three steps, and Megumi and Sumiki are still young. Toji wasn't heartless enough to leave such kids behind for a long time. I just won't do those kinds of missions. If there was someone in the Jujutsu headquarters with enough power or brains to force Toji into missions, the sorcerer world wouldn't be in such distress. Disarray. He scoffed at the thought. Zoro, seemingly losing interest, handed the ID card back to Toji. With a flick, Toji tossed the ID card into the air again and caught it. Zoro crossed his arms. How does it feel? Not sure. It was complicated. A swirl of emotions that Toji couldn't quite pinpoint stirred within him. Was this all there was to it? Was this what he got for dealing with those cursed users and teaching some young sorcerers? Of course. The cursed users Toji had taken down weren't just one or two, and the ones he taught weren't ordinary at all. Was he only accepted for that? The existence that is Zen and Toji. Then, why had he been ostracized for so long? It would have been better if I had died without being born. That was what his mother used to say every time she faced Toji. Having lost a significant position within the clan upon Toji's birth, she said that every time she saw him, suffering without being able to contain her anger until she passed away from this world. If it was going to end up like this, if so, it would have been better from the start, Papa. Megumi's voice snapped Toji out of his thoughts. Wearing his going out clothes, Megumi reached out to Toji. It was an unspoken request to be held. Toji carelessly stuffed the ID card into his pocket and picked up Megumi with one hand. Megumi naturally settled into Toji's embrace and rubbed his cheek against his chest. Since it was something he usually didn't do, Toji awkwardly patted Megumi's back. Does he know something? The hair brushing against his shirt felt prickly. Sumiki toddled over and reached out her hand to Toji. Uncle, hold my hand. It might hurt your arm. Because of Toji's height, young Sumiki had to lift her hand to hold Toji's. It's okay. When Sumiki raised her little hand height, Toji took it. Zoro stood beside Sumiki, looking at Toji with an expression that seemed to ask why they weren't leaving yet. It's just like my children to not give me a moment to dwell in sentimentality. Yet, before he knew it, the negative thoughts that had clouded Toji's mind had completely disappeared. Toji laughed softly, almost like a sigh, and said to Zoro, let's go. Yeah. As Toji and Zoro walked, they chatted casually. What are you going to do for your first lesson? Like it's the real deal. Be careful. You might end up killing those kids. It's fine. We have a reverse curse technician. Ah, was her name Shoko Yeri? Yeah, the girl you treated. Those kids are in for a tough time. Better than what real enemies would do to them. How far are you planning to go? All the way. He planned to give them a glimpse of hell. Gorjo Satoru scratched his head as he walked alongside Jito Suguri through Jujutsu High. Yawn. Did you oversleep yesterday? No. Slept like a good child, snoring away. Yaga Sensei made a fuss about going to bed early. Why would he come all the way to the dorms just to take away the game console? Gorjo grumbled about the previous night when he had intended to stay awake. In the past few days, the trio of first-year students at Jujutsu High had been unusually free. There were hardly any missions, and the classes were mostly theoretical. Especially yesterday, they had a day off entirely uncharacteristic for sorcerers. It was even more unusual considering that Gorjo and Jito were grade 1 sorcerers, and Shoko was a rare reverse curse technician. And now he calls us early in the morning. A new teacher is coming. We've had enough lessons from that gorilla, haven't we? Oh, my body still aches. Gorjo exaggeratedly punched his shoulder. Come to think of it, we haven't seen Teacher Toji lately. He must have been appointed as a Grade 1 Sorcerer with a recommendation. That gorilla is probably busy with missions as a Grade 1 Sorcerer by now. Maybe. They didn't know the details, but it was good news. They hoped not to see him again. Not just for a day or two, but for good. Shoko Yeri had arrived at the meeting place first and was smoking alone. Jito raised his hand to greet her. Hey Shoko, good morning. You look well. I had a good night's sleep for once. She spoke with an unusually vibrant voice. Even as a first year student, a reverse curse technician was very busy. 
After all, a sorcerer who could use reverse curse techniques, especially those that work on others, was extremely rare. Gorjo tilted his head quizzically, but why call us here, of all places? Who knows? The meeting place was the sports field that Satoru had recently demolished with his curse technique lapse. Blue. It was still in ruins, as the repairs had not yet begun. Is this the place? Yaga Sensei mentioned it several times it must be right. Here we are, what kind of lesson are we supposed to have in this mess? Gorjo flopped down anywhere. Shito looked down at Satoru with a resigned expression before sitting next to him. Satoru, tilting his head, said, well, it'll be good for practicing my techniques. There's nothing left to break. What are you practicing? Omitting the incantation and hand signs. And technique reversal. The former I'm sort of getting the hang of, but the latter. I have no clue. Gorjo murmured tilting his head. Right. Shoko. Teach us about reversal techniques. Wish and Voiler. What? Can you explain a bit more, Shoko? That's all there is to it. Don't you get it? You lack S-E-N-S-E till the cursed energy goes wish, then Voiler. Shoko flicked her fingers as she explained. But there was no way the two could understand. Gorjo sprang to his feet. Ah, I'm bored. When are they coming? I want to train my techniques. Flipping a place that's already been flipped over is all the same to me. Satoru, don't just think about destroying. Sorcery is fundamentally about protecting. It exists to protect the weak, the non-sorcerers. Jito calmly admonished him. Satoru scoffed. Don't try to attach a noble reason to power. Strength is just strength. Why attach a reason to it? Veins popped on Jito's forehead. Gorjo stuck out his tongue at him mockingly. Yeri was contemplating whether to skip the first lesson with the new teacher when. Are you two fighting again? Gorjo paused and then looked behind Jito. Toji was walking towards them, carrying Zoro on his shoulders. What's this? The gorilla is back again. He has arrived. I can feel everyone's dismay. Bangs. Toji set Zoro down on the ground. Shito looked around puzzled. Today, it's just Zoro. Where are the other kids? I left them with your headmaster. They wouldn't dare harm them. If they did, the next of those two would be the first to go, and besides, I've placed a binding on them. While it might be safer by Toji's side considering physical safety, today's activities were too violent for those kids to witness. Gorjo pushed down his sunglasses, smirking. Too bad? But today's the day a new teacher is supposed to arrive. Unfortunately, we don't have time to play with you. So why don't you just leave, Gorilla? Toji snickered and then threw something at Gorjo. A small, square object stopped in mid-air due to Gorjo's barrier and dropped down, which Gorjo caught. It was an object familiar to them. It was an ID card used by the staff of Jujutsu High. Gorjo held the ID card with Toji's photo glaringly imprinted on it, his hand trembling as he read the letters written on it. Zenin Toji, Grade 4 Sorcerer, Physical Techniques Teacher at Tokyo Jujutsu High School. The new teacher supposed to join was this gorilla. Gorjo flopped down on the spot. And then, belatedly, he exploded in anger. Why? Why are you becoming a teacher at Jujutsu High? And at the Tokyo school, at that? Yeah, tell me about it. As if those rotten oranges. They don't care as long as they're not the ones getting beaten up. Trash kids. Gorjo roared towards the upper management. Shito murmured in dismay. We clearly recommended him as a grade one. That's just how those upper management types are. Toji clapped his hands once. Now, now, focus. My name is Zen and Toji. I'm a grade 4 sorcerer, and as of today, I'll be the physical techniques teacher at this school. So then shall we begin this historic first lesson? Toji glanced at Yeri, who quickly stubbed out her cigarette on the ground and prepared to leave. I have no missions to attend to today. I'll be taking my leave. Sorry, but you have work to do today. You'll need to stay until the lesson is over. Zoro silently stood next to Shoko, and pointed her to a spot quite far from the sports field. You want me to go there? Why? Because it's safe there. This area is going to become dangerous. Zoro's presence beside Shoko was not only for observation, but also to protect her. Given what Toji might do to those two, Shoko needed to remain unharmed. Sensing that something big was about to happen, Shoko obediently moved to a spot quite far from the sports field. Life is precious, after all. Toji shook his head at the sight of the two, who had lost all their energy and were wilting like flimsy pieces of paper. Don't lose your strength just yet. Since it's our first official lesson, we'll do things a bit differently than usual. In this sparring match, the use of cursed energy and techniques is completely unrestricted. What? Ha! Huh. The previously deflated duo instantly regained their vitality and sprang to their feet. Toji smirked. See, they think they'll win as long as they can use their techniques. It was typical of sorcerers who believed their techniques were unbeatable, like frogs in a well. It was amusing, though not uncommon. Jito asked in disbelief, we can use techniques freely. Yes. Cursed energy, techniques, cursed tools, physical skills, tricks, use whatever you've got. Think of it as if you're facing a cursed user out to take your heads. Imposing restrictions would only lead them to believe they lost because of those limitations. He had to crush that possibility entirely. Gorjo hummed and then teased. What if you end up getting your neck snapped by us? We have a reverse curse technician. Ah, so that's why you called Shoko too, different from usual. Afraid you might die. Exactly. Of course, in the unlikely event of death, it wouldn't be Toji who would die. Ugh, Toji vomited a storage curse from his stomach. Seeing a curse that Toji had consumed and compacted into a small, round shape springing out of his mouth, Gorjo grimaced. Ugh, disgusting. Jito, surprised yet puzzled at the sight of the storage curse, swelling around Toji's shoulder, 
said, but you're not even a sorcerer, so why do you have a curse? It's my arsenal. I usually swallow it and keep it in my stomach. There were various reasons, but now wasn't the time to discuss them. Toji's expression turned impassive. Gorjo and Jito instinctively tensed up, sensing something different. This was interesting. These guys definitely have potential. They immediately knew when someone intended to kill them. Well, it would be problematic if they didn't have any potential despite being so blessed. You guys might not have such intentions, but there's absolutely no need to hold back against me. Because I won't be holding back either. Toji added with a smirk. Come at me together or one by one as you like. Though it might be more effective to come at him one by one, they could decide for themselves. Enemies in real combat wouldn't give them such advice. Come at me with all you've got. Gorjo scoffed with disdain. Hey, gorilla, even if it's you. Do you really think you can take on both of us at the same time? With the strongest, Gorjo's right, Mr. Zenin. I understand you're eager because it's your first day, but perhaps a different approach whisk. Toji vanished from sight. Instinctively, Jido twisted his body, but he couldn't catch up with Toji, who moved at an invisible speed. Thud. Toji had pierced Jito's abdomen with a single stroke of a dagger from the front. For a moment, both Jito and Gorjo couldn't grasp the situation. Just for a moment. As the pain began to register, Jito immediately used his technique. A black rift opened in the air, and a white, gigantic dragon-shaped curse. The rainbow dragon burst forth. Seeing this, Toji immediately withdrew his hand from the dagger and stepped back. Boom. The writhing rainbow dragon struck where Toji had been standing. Gorjo asked urgently, Suguru, are you okay? No problem. Jito looked down at the long sword that had pierced his abdomen. It hurt like hell, but the blade was small and it had missed his vital organs. Was it luck? No, no, it was deliberate. Becoming incapacitated this early wouldn't fit into Toji's plan. It's a lesson after all. In that sense, this dagger was also a warning. He won't kill, but he won't stop halfway through, will he? It was a mistake. They hadn't anticipated that he could move so fast and mercilessly. Jito thought grimly, it would be better not to remove that. At the sudden sound of Toji's voice, Jito and Gorjo instantly turned around. Toji was leisurely walking from a completely different direction than where the rainbow dragon had attacked. A sharp gleam flashed in his eyes. Satoru extended his arm immediately. His head was hot with anger and the desire to win. Normally, Gorjo needed an incantation to activate his blue technique, but somehow, it felt unnecessary now. Cursed technique laps blue. Toji's form vanished again. An immense pulling force swirled in blue dragging even the trees from a distant forest crushing them. Crack! Beneath where Toji landed, a giant, one-eyed monster curse surged upward. Boom! Toji stepped on the fist of the attacking curse, and leaped into the air, vanishing from the side of the curse, and both Gorjo and Jito in the blink of an eye. The curse looked around in confusion. Damn it! Gorjo cursed. Despite having just succeeded in using the blue technique without an incantation for the first time, he couldn't feel happy about it. I wasn't hit by the blue. I wasn't even in the range of the technique. The subsequent attack from the curse too, Toji evaded like it was child's play. As if he knew exactly where and how they would attack. Jito glanced at Gorjo. Satoru, it's okay, just bring out whatever you have. Upon Gorjo's cue, Jito waved his hand. Several black holes appeared above the Jujutsu high sky, from which black, round curses poured out, scattering in all directions. Pop 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 pop. The round curses rained down from the air like rain. As soon as they hit the ground, they burst, spreading a thick purple point poison fog. This poison fog would paralyze a non-sorcerer with just a single inhalation. However, it posed a risk to both Jito and Gorjo as well. Of course, it wouldn't affect Mr. Toji to that extent, but at least it should slow down his movements click clatter. Somewhere, the sound of chains dragging on the ground echoed. Gorjo shouted urgently, Be careful, Suguru. The chains, attached to a cursed tool, swung wildly and impossibly long. Jito quickly ducked to avoid the cursed tool that was past where his head had been. Boom. Gorjo launched another spear towards the chains, but as if mocking him, the chains did not continue their attack and retracted back to their owner. Whoosh. As the chains returned, a strong wind dispersed the poison fog. Chain of a thousand miles. That's the name of this cursed tool. It keeps extending if the end isn't observed. Well, it's not exactly the best item to use against you guys. Toji said as he stuffed the chain of a thousand miles back into the curse's mouth. Seeing him emerge unscathed, the faces of Jito and Gorjo twisted simultaneously. Satoru, together, he'll just dodge if we attack now. That guy is too fast. Plus, with no cursed energy, it's hard to track him with the naked eye. Even if they attacked Toji right in front of them, he would would evade before the attack could even reach him. Of course, both knew Toji was fast. Would be stupid not to know after getting hit that much. But they hadn't thought he could always move at such speed. Nor did they think he could dodge every attack so effortlessly. It's like he knows everything. Where they are, what technique they will use, and how. A grade 4 sorcerer like that? Gorjo muttered in dismay. Is he even human? A physically gifted with zero cursed energy, a heavenly restricted body. Instead of cursed energy, I was born with inherently superior physical abilities. I'm like an invisible man in terms of sorcery, barely perceptible even to your eyes. The curse I use to store my weapons is different, though. That's why I usually keep it inside my body. Since sorcery can't recognize me, it can't recognize the curse inside my body either. A binding that increases physical abilities by revealing information to the opponent. 
Since such bindings weren't rare among sorcerers, Jito quickly caught on, was mentioning the features of the Chain of a Thousand Miles earlier because of this. Realizing why Toji was uncharacteristically talkative, Gordry chuckled. This was quite something. Is knowing where we will use what technique also part of that heavenly restricted body's physical abilities? Who knows? That's clairvoyance. Toji had no real reason to inform Gojo about it. After all, he was playing the role of a cursed user against his students. Hearing Toji drone on about things they already knew and keeping silent on the parts they were curious about frustrated Gojo. Damn gorillas making a fool of us. Screech. Suddenly Toji's world turned blue. Instead of the ruined Jujutsu High Sports Field, he saw a strange space intertwined with wooden rectangles. At the end of Toji's gaze stood a curse in the form of a woman. The curse, with bandages wrapped around her face and long black hair draping down, said, Here I am, me. Me, Nanana Crackle. Numerous grotesque eyes appeared between the strands of the curse's hair, throwing a chilling question. Am I pretty? Creating a non-aggression zone with an imaginary curse. It seemed to enforce non-aggression on both the opponent and herself until answered. Toji tilted his head. Although it was an unusual form, it wasn't something he couldn't handle. If I answer affirmatively and it's a lie, the risk comes back to me. If I answer negatively, the curse will strengthen. Therefore, an ambiguous answer that is neither affirmative nor negative is best. Toji clearly told the curse, you're not my type. The scissors in the curse's hand moved. Giant paper scissors appeared from everywhere, encircling Toji's body and trying to penetrate. However, due to the armored aura of fortitude surrounding Toji, not a single drop of blood was shed. Toji nodded. Pretty good. It would be better to keep this one alive. Toji's arm turned black with the armament haki. In an instant, moving from where the scissors were two in front of the curse, Toji swung his fist enveloped in the haki. Thud. Clang. The form of the curse disintegrated, and the temporary domain was dissolved. He had hit it gently, hoping it hadn't died. And right after Toji was freed from the temporary domain, what he saw was an endless expanse of blue. Gorjo, with blue energy trapped between his hands, grinned brightly. You're too late, gorilla. While Toji was spending time in the temporary domain, Gorjo had been preparing his maximum output of the curse technique lapse blue. Phase, Twilight, Eye of Wisdom. A massive blue force undulated in front of Toji's face as the incantation was spoken. This couldn't be avoided. Curse technique lapse, maximum output, blue. Curse technique lapse, blue, at maximum output. The moment Toji saw the boundless expanse of blue, the corners of his mouth turned up. Now's the moment. The moment Gorjo Satoru focused solely on offense, neglecting defense. That was the moment Toji had been waiting for. From the arsenal curse's mouth sprang forth our inverted spear of heaven. The armament haki, drawn to its limit, enveloped Toji's entire body and the spear in stark blackness. Gorjo Satoru was unaware of the armament haki. He was also unaware of the inverted spear of heaven. Both were things Toji had never mentioned or used in front of Gorjo and Jito. While Gorjo had seen glimpses of the armament haki, the inverted spear of heaven was entirely new to him. It had been deliberately hidden, for this very moment. Even Gorjo Satoru couldn't imagine and prepare for a weapon he had neither seen nor heard of. The inverted spear of heaven, capable of forcibly disengaging any active technique regardless of its nature, was not common or famous enough for Gorjo to anticipate. Moreover, the armament haki compensated for the inverted spear of heaven's relative fragility, ensuring it wouldn't be destroyed even by the explosive force of blue, allowing it to pierce through. All of this became possible in the hands of a physically gifted individual with zero cursed energy, capable of tearing through the void itself. That was Gorjo Satoru's critical mistake. Enveloped in the armament haki, Toji overcame the pulling force of blue. Counteracting the sensation of being drawn in, Toji swung the inverted spear of heaven powerfully towards Gorjo's neck from the front. Powered by the heavenly restricted body's strength and clad in the armament haki, the inverted spear of heaven pierced through Gorjo Satoru's invincible defense, embedding itself in his neck. Crack! Blood burst forth. Gorjo's neck was half transpierced, staining the Jujutsu High uniform red with his blood. Cough. Even as Gorjo spat out blood, he tried to grasp Toji's hand. At that reaction Toji's green eyes displayed a sharp murderous intent. Like during his days as a sorcerer killer who delivered certain death to his opponents, Toji maneuvered the embedded inverted spear of heaven, slicing through Gorjo's upper body. Slash. Satoru Jito cried out as he saw Gorjo collapse, drenched in blood. Breathing heavily, Toji turned to face Jito who charged at him, having lost all reason. It was a mistake. It wasn't supposed to go this far. But with a reverse curse technician around, it shouldn't be a major problem. Shito, with veins bulging in his eyes, reached out towards Toji's arsenal curse. I have to seal the arsenal first. While the heavenly restricted body's physical abilities are remarkable, there's a limit to the attack patterns without a curse tool. The functions are special, but the power it holds isn't extraordinary. I'll subjugate and seal the arsenal curse first. Then from a distance, I'll unleash all the curses I've subdued to kill him. The moment Jito's hand touched the arsenal curse, intending to carry out his resolve, whoosh. A strong repulsion force flung Jito away. Thud. Toji's roundhouse kick landed squarely on the bewildered Jito's head. As he staggered dizzily, another kick to the side sent Jito flying. Ugh. Jito crumpled to the ground in the sports field, writhing before eventually becoming still. He wasn't dead, as his heartbeat could be heard, he seemed to have fainted. Toji had intentionally held back just enough. What was he trying to do? 
He had attempted to steal Toji's arsenal curse. It seemed he was unaware that a curse that has already formed a servitude contract cannot be a target of curse manipulation. It's not an easy fact to know. Toji himself had learned it from an old book deep within the Zenin family's archives when he was young. In any case, it was over. Both of them. Toji checked the arsenal curse's condition before putting the inverted spear of heaven back into its mouth. He sighed. Annoying brats. Though it took a bit more effort than expected, Toji emerged victorious without a scratch. It was a win for Zen and Toji. Toji gestured towards Yeri, who was standing at a distance. She seemed quite worried about rushing over with full falls. One was unconscious, and the other had his throat pierced. It would be strange if she wasn't worried. Roar. A one-eyed giant curse bellow from within the forest. Toji turned towards the noise. Ah, I should have asked Jido to recall the curses. Caught up in the excitement, he had made a mistake. Toji clicked his tongue. It was difficult to wake up someone unconscious. A curse running wild in Jujutsu High would be troublesome. While dispelling it was easy, doing so would diminish Jido's power. Something Toji wanted to avoid if possible. As Toji was pondering what to do next, bang. He turned towards the sound. Behind a pale-faced rushing Shoko Yeri, Zoro was seen knocking down the rainbow dragon with a sword. Screech. The rainbow dragon twitched its white body before collapsing to the ground with a thud. Leaving the fallen rainbow dragon behind, Zoro, with a face full of excitement, charged at the one-eyed giant curse. The fact that the rainbow dragon remained down without disappearing, suggested it was likely knocked unconscious. Having worried when Zoro was around made me a fool. Toji rubbed the back of his neck. He felt a strange mix of emptiness and fatigue. Maybe because I've drawn too much armament haki in such a short time. This was the first time Toji had used so much armament haki in such a short period. The haki is the power of a spirit. It has its limits. If the armament haki is overused in a short period, one might not be able to use it for some time or it could even shorten one's lifespan, Zoro had said before. Trying to wrap his fist in the armament haki, as expected, not a bit of it emerged. He had indeed exhausted it, Toji realized. I need to rest. Shoko Yeri, seeing her peers lying bloodied on the sports field, turned pale. Despite habitually calling them trash, she knew and believed in her peers' strength more than anyone, making the shock all the more intense. How could this happen? They could have really died. That's why I called you in advance. Heal them quickly. Yeri nodded rapidly, her fear palpable, but Toji thought it reasonable and turned away. It was true he had attacked more severely than planned. Just as Yeri was about to pour her reverse technique on the significantly more critical Gorjo. Don't do that one. A young yet calm voice stopped her hand in its tracks. Zoro, having subdued all of Jito's curses, approached Toji and Shoko, wiping the purple fluid of a curse off his face with his fingers. His youthful, round face betrayed a mix of surprise and joy. It's not over yet. What are you talking about? The training's already finished. If you don't use the reverse technique right now, Gorjo's going to die. Yeri found it strange that she couldn't pour the reverse technique on Gorjo, despite the child's words. A mere kid, yet there was an old charisma in his words and demeanor. He'll handle it himself. What do you mean? Twitch. Gorjo's hand moved as he lay in a pool of blood. Both Yeri and Toji stepped back in surprise. Zoro looked down at the fallen Gorjo. Honestly, Zoro had been a bit worried when Toji said he'd be teaching. Not about Toji, but the students learning from him. But since Toji wanted it, Zoro didn't say much. He thought there would be something for the students to gain from finding someone as strong as Toji. But then, you're doing pretty well, Dad. To bring him to this point so quickly. Zoro smiled, feeling the strong presence through his clairvoyance. Gorjo Satoru's condition began to stabilize. The gushing blood significantly lessened, and his breathing returned. Reverse technique. Yeri murmured in a daze. Almost simultaneously, Toji also exclaimed in astonishment. What a monster. As if melting snow, all of Gorjo's wounds disappeared. The wound pierced by the heavenly reverse spear on his neck. The diagonal slash across his torso. Gorjo Satoru's body trembled weakly. Once, then twice. And then, his blue eyes opened again. Long white eyelashes followed the motion of the eyelids, fluttering down and then lifting again. The sky blue eyes captured the clarity of a rare winter sky. He sees everything. He understands everything. Everything Gorjo Satori thought he had seen and understood up to now was merely the surface. Now that he had grasped the essence of cursed energy and mastered the art of reverse techniques, he could see beyond the limits of the world and cursed energy. So ah, uh, it was delightful. Ah ha ha ha. Ha! Ha 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 ha. Endlessly, boundlessly. Shoko Yuri's pearl, dismayed face barely registered to him. At this moment, Gorjo Satoru was too absorbed in savoring his own emotions. Good, refreshing, liberating. He had never felt so good in his life. Gorjo sprang to his feet, looking around. Where is it? Where is it? His actions were buoyant and lively, like a child searching for a hidden gift box on their birthday. Then, his gaze met Toji's, who was standing quietly and watching. Ah, there you are. Gorjo Satoru beamed brightly. Gorilla, no Zen and Toji. Thank you. When you drew that cursed tool to stab my neck, I realized it then. The strange cursed energy emanating from that tool. Physically healed, but not mentally. Shoko Yeri quickly assessed the situation and moved from Gorjo to Jito. And then it hit me. You couldn't possibly be unaware of my limitless. Yet you charged at me with an ordinary cursed tool. And you, a member of the Zenin family, 
No, Nuo, that couldn't be. So, at that moment, I focused all my nerves on the reverse technique. Bright blue eyes encapsulated the world. Right now, Gorjo Satoru was truly, truly in high spirits. Nearly died. But it was at the brink of death that I grasped the essence of cursed energy, the inversion of techniques. I had never gotten the hang of it before. The only one who could, Shoko, would just go wish in Voila, speaking in riddles. Aha ha. Ha ha ha. Toji observed Gorjo closely. He was rambling. This wasn't about revealing information under a binding. He wasn't even in a state to be aware of such a thing. He's in a state of excitement. Hi. Becoming engrossed in the thrill of battle is a common occurrence. Toji had encountered a few sorcerers in such a state before. However, the current Gorjo Satoru wasn't the same as those Toji had faced before. Different. He could tell without needing to use observation haki. The Gorjo Satoru before him was different from the youth Toji had just confronted and slashed at the throat. Born like a comet during a time when curses were subsiding. Gorjo was the powerhouse the Gorjo family and the sorcery world had imagined, and longed for over centuries. The modern era's strongest sorcerer. Though it seemed ridiculous that all it took was one stab with a knife considering Gorjo was born with the Limitless and belonged to the Gorjo family. It's unlikely he'd ever be in a situation to be stabbed in the neck anyway. I want to defeat him. Suddenly, a desire surged within Toji. It was the desire of a warrior who wished to battle a strong opponent, but also the desire of Zen and Toji, who had hardly ever been truly recognized in his life. Before him undoubtedly stood the strongest sorcerer of the modern era. If he could defeat him, all in the sorcery world would have to acknowledge it. The strength and existence of Zen and Toji. Slight rustle. It was when Toji, with his vacant green eyes fixed on Satoru, grasped the handle of the inverted Spear of Heaven protruding from the curse's mouth. However, he did not pull it out. The hand holding the inverted Spear of Heaven twitched. Dominating Toji's mind now were anticipation, excitement, and a sense of discord. Something was off. Toji snapped to his senses as if doused with ice water, and released his grip on the inverted Spear of Heaven. He then became aware of the sense of discord filling his mind. The dulled armament haki from extensive use in the recent fight was sending a strange warning throughout his body. Zoro's words from years ago, when Toji first began learning armament haki, came to mind. Because your senses and physical abilities are so good, you'll unconsciously try to use those instead armament haki. Back then, he didn't understand why that was bad. He vaguely thought it was because it hindered learning armament haki. Now I see. Beyond the limits of what the body can perceive. Even if perceived, failing to properly relay it to the brain. Armament haki makes one aware of such things. There's no winning. Absolutely not. At least not now. You'd be taken down in an instant. It was exactly as Zoro said. Thud. Zoro's hand grabbed Toji's. With that small force, Toji's body stopped as if obeying an irrefutable command. Looking up at Toji, Zoro asked calmly, Are we going to fight? Deep concern, conviction, and some form of readiness were evident on his youthful, innocent face. He knows about the outcome when Toji fought with Gorjo. Toji took a deep breath, then slowly exhaled. He gently placed his thick hand atop Zoro's head. We're not fighting. Softly. After softly stroking the green hair, Toji fully retracted the inverted Spear of Heaven into the curse, then rolled up the arsenal curse and swallowed it. I refuse unpaid labor. That's enough lessons for today. Beating someone up might be fun, but getting beaten up isn't fun at all. Toji wasn't foolish enough to engage in a fight he was certain to lose. After giving them a good beating as planned, it was time to withdraw. Huh. Seeing the bewildered face of Gorjo Satoru made Toji feel a bit better. He chuckled lightly and clapped his hands briskly twice. Alright, that's a WRAP tilde everyone, disband, disband. Toji approached the fallen Jito and hoisted him up. Thanks to Yeri's reverse technique, the injuries had healed. But Jito was still out cold. I'll just dump him at the infirmary. Leaving a student unconscious could lead to trouble for Toji's livelihood. Gorjo, who had been dazedly watching the scene, protested belatedly. Wait a second. Running off after stabbing me in the neck? Where do you think you're going? When the lesson ends is up to the teacher. And once the lesson is over, there's no reason for the teacher to stick around, especially if the student is a guy. Toji who would never make a good teacher even if he died and came back, fought this as he turned away. Gorjo was shouting at the top of his lungs. Wait, I'll give you money. I'll give you as much as you want, so let's fight again. No thanks. I'm gonna dump this guy in the infirmary and then take a nap with my marimo son. Did you really think I'd come here just to die for you, you fool? Toji sneered. Fighting Gorjo with all his might and winning was out of the question, but Toji still was the physical education teacher at Jujutsu High. There were still plenty of opportunities to get the better of him during non-cursed energy physical classes. Watching Toji walk away leisurely while carrying Jito. Gorjo stomped his feet in frustration. Just once, just one more time, let's fight. Shoko, catch that guy. Do you want me to die? Yeri, who had just finished using a reverse technique and was resting, grimaced. Catching someone who had just beaten both Gorjo and Jito at the same time was akin to asking her to commit suicide. Just when she thought she could finally rest. Such was her fate. Yeri murmured to herself as she stood up and then turned back to Gorjo. Oh, Gorjo, you come to the infirmary too. We need to check if there's something wrong with your head. I'm fine. I don't think so. He clearly wasn't in his right mind, though he always was a bit off. Well, who can stop him? He'll return when it's time. Yeri thought as she hurried towards the infirmary. Left alone, Gorjo, now in a more ruined sports field than before, 
before the lesson pulled at his hair in frustration. Ah, so annoying. Where's the law in this? Revenge match should be granted. His howls, unheard by anyone, echoed loudly throughout Jujutsu High. Gorjo Satoru was standing in the ruins of a sports field, swept clean by a maximum output of cursed technique reverse once, and again by the decisive battle between Gorjo and Toji, the sports field of Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College, had now become too damaged to repair. A few days later, upon seeing the sports field where the two had fought, Yaga swallowed an anti-nausea medicine he had become accustomed to taking. He then asked Toji what he thought about restoring the site. Just leave it. Those guys need a space where they can freely practice their cursed techniques. It would just break again anyway, Toji answered indifferently. Thus, the sports field remained torn up and overturned, becoming a space where students could practice their destructive curse techniques. Just like now, Chito Suguru and Yeri Shoko were sitting side by side on the outskirts of the sports field, looking at Gorjo Satoru standing alone in the center. Gorjo lifted his finger, and his blue eyes shone through his black sunglasses. Curse technique reversal, red, a flash of red light, and an explosive energy that pushed everything away burst forth. Not only the overturned sports field, but even the trees nearby were blown away. Kwa Ang, trees were uprooted and flown away, distorting the forest, but Gorjo did not stop. This was not the end. A blue curse technique lapse, blue, a red curse technique reversal, red. He raises both at the same time and clashes them together. Gorjo extended his arm, a purple light created by mixing blue and red flashed beautifully and threateningly from his fingertips. Hollow technique purple. With a flick of his fingers, the view suddenly turned purple. An absolute power shock with impossible to defend against engulfed the sports field and the forest beyond. When Jito was able to properly see in front of him again, the dense forest of the academy had a gaping hole in it. Yay! Success! Gorjo energetically bounced up and down. Chito clapped his hands in applause. Congratulations, Satoru. He, turning towards his peers, Gorjo made a triumphant V-sign with a proud expression. Chito laughed heartily, while Shoko grimaced with a groan. You've become incredibly strong, Satoru. When did you master the reverse curse technique? Right after Toji Sensei stabbed me. Chito's face twisted severely. And you still call him Sensei after going through that? Huh. Oh, yeah. Are you okay? Totally. The first time shock of being utterly defeated, the humiliation of a total loss, the pain of having one's throat pierced and upper body split in half. Such feelings were insignificant and meaningless, compared to the joy and exhilaration of mastering the reverse curse technique and reaching its pinnacle. In heaven and on earth, I alone am honored. It is I alone who is revered in this world. Since it was Toji who had led him to this stage, Satori Gorjo was, in his way, thankful. Of course, Jito Suguru felt differently. You might be okay, but I'm not. Jito still couldn't shake the image of his friend collapsing, bleeding from the neck. It was the first time I'd ever seen Satori like that since we were born. It was also the first time Jito himself had felt so powerless against someone. Despite mastering the exceptional curse technique of summoning and even appropriate martial arts, none of it was useful against Toji. The curse user killer, Zen and Toji's notorious reputation became something Jito could seriously appreciate. Satoru became much stronger after mastering the reverse curse technique. Even knowing this, Jito never let Gorjo be alone with Toji after that incident. As for Toji, he didn't care whether Jito was cautious or not. Don't worry, Suguru. My body is much stronger now. Gorjo confidently smiled and placed his hands on his hips. Speaking of which, I've wanted to try fighting Toji-sensei with this technique. But Toji had slipped away at that time, preventing the fight. Of course, if Toji had really fought Gorjo, he would have died. He was strong, but he hadn't reached the same level as Gorjo. And at that time, Gorjo had no mindset to control his power. It was just exhilarating. The entire world is seen through his eyes. Toji probably knew as well, that if they fought now, he would definitely lose. So, he quickly made himself scarce, ensuring that Gorjo couldn't recklessly attack, while also taking Suguru into account. Days passed, and despite Gorjo's numerous attempts, Toji still refused to engage in a cursed technique duel. It seems like it'll never happen. His skillful avoidance and excuses were frustrating yet somehow fitting. Avoiding an unbeatable opponent or finding another way is a killer's trait, after all. When Gorjo turned his head, Jito also shifted his gaze in the same direction. At the end of the gaze, a small green head boy that is, Zoro, was seen approaching. Shoko asked in confusion, What are you doing here? What about you guys? Why are you here? What do you mean you're lost again, aren't you? Zoro's poor sense of direction was well known to everyone. How he managed to do it was beyond anyone's guess, as Zoro almost never found his way on his own. Not only could he not distinguish north, south, east and west, but even with someone beside him, he would often wander off in a different direction. Even when walking down the nearly straight corridors of the academy, he would end up going back the way he came, prompting concerns that something was seriously wrong with him. Jito asked kindly, How did you end up here? The academy moved, of course. That wasn't the case. It was Zoro who got lost. Jito couldn't bring himself to say that outright, but Gorjo, without any filter, bluntly voiced his thoughts. You got lost, Yudomorimo. What? 
Gorjo took off his sunglasses and scrutinized Zoro with a serious look. Even after achieving his current level, Zoro showed no signs of any curse or curse-related traits. It doesn't seem like you're a directionally challenged curse user. That was a mystery in itself. How could someone not be a directionally challenged curse user and still get lost this badly? Shito squatted down to be at eye level with Zoro and offered his hand. Since the next class is a theory class, let's go together. Even though Jito was wary of Toji, that caution didn't extend to Zoro. Survival of the weakest. That was Jito's creed, and a non-sorcerer child was the epitome of the weak. Oh, thanks. And unlike Toji, Zoro readily expressed his gratitude. Jito smiled at the sight. Zoro pointed towards the forest that Satoru had blown away in the exact opposite direction of the building where their class was. This way, right? Just hold my hand and follow me, okay? Shito knew from long experience that some things never change. In his view, Zoro's lack of direction was one of those things. Shito firmly grasped Zoro's hand to prevent him from running off. Shoko, observing Zoro's tendency to veer off despite having people on either side, murmured, might need a thorough examination to see if there are any lasting effects. Western Marku, you, you, the Marimo, that is. Gorjo playfully poked Zoro's cheek. Wah! Megumi walked up to Zoro, who was sitting in a chair, with a toddling step and whined as he snuggled into his arms. Since Megumi got lost while they were playing together, Zoro had no words to offer. Sorry. Mew. Zoro familiarly lifted Megumi into his arms. Seeing Megumi's eyes faintly wet, Zoro made a troubled face. Don't cry. Wah. Zoro gently patted the back of the whimpering Megumi. Sumiki scolded Zoro sternly. You can't go alone. From now on, let's always go together. Why? TSK. Let's go together. No matter where. Sumiki insisted. If not, I'll wear all the belly bands. I'll wear them all so you can't wear any. Why would you wear my belly bands? Then why do you go alone when you can't find a way? Hey. Gorjo laughed out loud watching the small girl scold the slightly larger boy. She's Phyllis. Standing up to him like that. Family is all like that. Jito, too, despite being called the strongest sorcerer at the academy, was just another son at home. I should contact them after a long time. A smile appeared on Jito's lips as he thought of his parents. Huh. If you disappear without saying anything. Huh? Do you know how much it hurts here? Sumiki then climbed onto the chair where Zoro was sitting, after patting her chest with her palms, and stretched Zoro's cheeks like sticky rice cakes. Sigh. Zoro sighed. Sumiki flinched and backed off, checking his reaction when she might have been too harsh. Sorry. A gruff apology came back. As Sumiki gently approached Zoro again, he stroked her head. I like you, brother. Yeah. I hate it when you leave Zoro silently pulled Sumiki into his embrace. On the chair, the three children huddled together like one. Shoko sat quietly in the classroom chair, observing the scene before her. It wasn't particularly awkward or surprising to her, having seen it multiple times before. Those kids, well, it was like they're more like parents and children than siblings. Of course, that wasn't an extremely rare occurrence. When parents were negligent or there was a significant age gap, it wasn't uncommon for the older child to take on a parental role. Shoko recalled the sight of Toji, who had sent two students to the brink of the other world, and then swiftly retreated to the faculty dormitory. Well, it's true he's negligent. It wasn't that he completely abandoned parental responsibilities or duties. Whenever Toji wasn't teaching or on a mission, he was usually found by the children's side. But those two always turned to Zoro for everything. Whether it was something scary, something they needed to say, or something they wanted to be done. Megumi and Sumiki would first seek out Zoro. Only if Zoro was unavailable or busy would they then turn to Toji, even if Toji was closer. Toji took this for granted. It might seem like passing parental responsibilities onto the son it's different. When Zoro decided what to do after listening, the implementation of that decision was usually carried out by Toji alone or both Toji and Zoro together. Zoro holds more authority than that teacher. It's not about who is stronger in terms of power. It's about who holds the upper hand in relationships. Whether in parent-child relationships, romantic relationships, or friendships, there are those who lead and those who do not. Zoro firmly held that leading position within his family. In other words, the linchpin and the head of the household was Zoro. Interesting. Is six-year-old being the head of the household? While most people would be astonished at such a realization, Yuri Shoko, a fully-fledged sorcerer herself, found it absurd. At least the people in that household seemed perfectly content with their roles, and they weren't harming anyone. That settles it. Shoko wasn't the type to meddle in office family affairs to such an extent. She withdrew her attention and interest at that point. Gorjo tilted his head at the sight of the children clinging and snuggling up to Zoro's body. Is this a fusion? With that spiny one's main power, maybe... But that girl won't be much help. Cheeto handed Gorjo a notebook filled with Chinese characters. Do your homework. Why hasn't Yaga Sensei come yet? Exactly. He's overdue. The door opened with a creak and Toji appeared. Cheeto's face instantly soured. And Gorjo, who had been lying on the desk, perked up his head. What? Why is Gorilla Sensei here? Yaga suddenly got a mission, so I came in his place. Today's class is self-study. Oh man. I would have skipped if I knew this. Gorjo's posture slumped immediately. Toji, wiping off the green bodily fluids of a cursed spirit that had splattered on his face, noticed his children clinging to a tree 
and hanging like cicadas. What happened? Brother got lost again. At Tsumiki's tattling, Toji's eyes narrowed. He looked at Zoro with a reproaching expression. I told you never to go anywhere alone. The building moved. How many times do I have to tell you? You're the one who got lost. What to do with this chronic case of getting lost? Toji massaged his throbbing head. Did you come back from a mission? Cursed spirit or sorcerer? What grade was it? It was a cursed spirit. Special grade. That's why he was a bit late. Toji roughly wiped the cursed spirit's fluids off with tissue paper found in the classroom. Shito asked with a somewhat wary expression. Didn't you say you're a grade 4 sorcerer? Right. But I also do missions for grade 1 sorcerers. Why on earth? They said it was a grading mistake. Of course. That was nonsense. Although the Jujutsu headquarters might be incompetent, confusing a grade 1 mission for a grade 4 mission was rare due to the significant disparity. They know what they're doing, pretending not to. It was a clear intent to have him killed. Of course, Toji was not one to die so easily. He completed all his missions. Sometimes they really do miscalculate the grades. Yesterday, Toji reported to the headquarters in his mission report. Assigning his mission as a grade 4 task could lead to a real grade 4 sorcerer's death if they took it on. So he told them not to spout nonsense about grading errors and to sort it out properly. Thinking of the upper echelons grinding their teeth made him feel good. Toji, tidying up his clothes a bit, asked. So what's this class about? You didn't even listen before coming in. I'm busy, so is Yaga. The job of a teacher at the Jujutsu High was busier than Toji had vaguely imagined. Missions, supervision and guidance of students, teaching, assigning missions to students, and receiving reports on the outcomes. Even though he mostly ignored missions that took a long time or required travel far away. Citing the reason that at least one teacher needed to remain at the Jujutsu High, he was still quite busy. There was a reason for this. Currently, Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College only had two teachers. Masamichi Yaga, responsible for grades 1 to 5, and Toji Fushiguro, the physical education teacher. Insane. Having only two teachers in a high school was absurd. Even if the technical college wasn't a normal school, it was still far too few. There was a principal, but rather than working, he was an old man so sick he could die at any time. So Yaga was essentially fulfilling the principal's role as well. Originally, the technical college didn't just have two teachers. Yaga was in charge of grades 1 to 3, and there was another teacher for grades 4 to 5. However, not long after Toji became a teacher, the teacher responsible for grades 4 to 5 got severely injured on a mission. The injury wasn't incurable, but it required continuous rehabilitation, necessitating at least six months of convalescence. In other words, for at least the next six months, Yago and Toji had to handle all the classes at the technical college. Knowing the circumstances as a sorcerer, Yeri Shoko looked at Toji with sympathy and readily answered, It's a kanji class. Ah, it's important for sorcerers to memorize various kanji. From the names of techniques and talismans to incantations, there was no aspect of sorcery that didn't use kanji. I can help out with that to some extent. From a teacher who isn't even a sorcerer, Shito sarcastically pretended not to care. After the duel, it wasn't Gorjo who had suffered more, but rather Jito, whose attitude towards Toji had sharpened. Constantly glancing at Gorjo and glaring at Toji, as if thinking Toji might harm Gorjo again. Even if I intentionally ambush him now, it'd be hard to kill him since the young master has become a monster. Whether he knew this yet pretended not to, or truly didn't know. Either way, it was a touching friendship. Toji thought dismissively and responded, If you ask, I can at least tell you if it's correct or incorrect. As a child living in the Zenin household, Toji often hid in the library to read books. It was then he learned about various kanji, techniques, and talismans. Toji found the library, of all places in the Zenin household, to be the most comfortable. Few people came and went, it was quiet, and importantly, he wasn't beaten there, at least. Of course, that was because the precious books shouldn't be splattered with the dirty blood of a monkey. A scar twisted at the corner of Toji's mouth. Shoko quickly handed Toji her kanji notebook. Could you check if these kanji are written correctly? After looking through Shoko's notebook, Toji pointed out one of the kanji with his finger. This one, the stroke count is wrong. It should be one, not two. After being corrected, Shoko hurriedly flipped through a thick kanji dictionary to check. Realizing Toji was right, she laughed in defeat. Really? Toji smoothly answered several more of Shoko's questions. Gorjo, with his feet up on the desk, fiddled around. It really baffles me. Why did the Zenin family expel you? I've been to the Zenin household a few times because of the high school meetings but there was no one with skills like yours. I wasn't expelled. I left on my own. Why the Zenin family didn't officially disown Toji was a mystery even to him. Maybe because he was the direct son of the previous head, or they were planning to sell him off somewhere. Whatever the plan was, it must have been ruined when Toji left the household. Why did you leave the family? Couldn't stand the sight of those old folks. It wasn't entirely a lie, but it wasn't the whole truth either. There was no reason to elaborate. Maybe if Zoro asked, 
but not Jito. Toji glanced briefly at Zoro, who was fast asleep in his arms. He always managed to sleep well, no matter where he was. Any more questions? Gorjo raised his hand high. Me, me, Mr. Toji, I have a question. What is this lunatic going to say? Despite feeling apprehensive, Toji nodded for him to go ahead. Gorjo Satoru, with an innocent face, threw a bombshell question. On the day we jeweled, what was that black energy enveloping your body? The sound of Zoro's sleeping breaths filled the room. Amid the subtle silence and tension in the classroom, Sumiki, who was about to fall asleep in Zoro's arms, opened her brown eyes wide, and anxiously glanced around. Toji looked at Gorjo Satoru with an expressionless face. He hadn't expected the question not to come. If it hadn't, he would have laughed at the stupidity of it. Unlike Observation Haki, which couldn't be detected with the naked eye, Armament Haki, which coats the body or weapons, cannot be hidden because the coated area turns black. Yet, he had no choice but to use it, because without Haki, the outcome of the fight would have been uncertain. It wasn't a surprise attack or a battle where either was tired or had used up a significant amount of their techniques. It was a head-on fight with Gorjo Satoru, who was in peak condition and had support. It was strange, you see. I've occasionally glimpsed you hitting Suguru's cursed spirits with your bare hands. Gorjo's eyes, carrying a hint of cold light, seemed to pierce through as they met Toji's green risers. It was too fast to see properly, but it was definitely with your bare hands. Physical attacks shouldn't work on cursed spirits and a talentless curse like you shouldn't be able to manipulate energy. So, I thought maybe you had some unique curse tool I didn't know about. Maybe something related to invisible techniques. It wasn't an invisible technique, but there was indeed a unique curse tool. Gorjo unconsciously touched the spot on his neck that had been pierced that day. The sensation of the void being filled and then sealed away at the moment his throat was pierced, and the weapon entered was still vivid, surely surprised. A curse tool that could forcibly deactivate an active technique was indeed a trump card. However, the black energy that Toji used when facing Jido's cursed spirits and during the duel which dyed his whole body black, wasn't due to that cursed tool's ability. What was that, exactly? Gorjo saw the blackened form of Toji clearly with his own eyes, yet at the same time, he saw nothing at all. Even when seeing a unique cursed tool for the first time, he could immediately understand its effect with his eyes, but he could not grasp any identity, principle, or performance of the black energy. Is this what it feels like for a normal sorcerer without the six eyes to see techniques? An additional effect of a talentless curse. Restraints. The action of a special curse tool. He earnestly pondered and came up with various hypotheses, but had to discard them all. If it were any of those, he wouldn't have failed to recognize them with his eyes. I knew a talentless curse the moment I saw one, so it's impossible I couldn't recognize those. The unknown. It was something that could only capture the interest of Gorjo Satoru who had been able to see everything since birth. Toji, still with an expressionless face, countered. What would you do if you knew, young master? Tell me. At that lively demand, the strange tension that had been lingering in the classroom dissipated. Shoko exhaled the breath that had been caught in her throat. Separately, Toji flatly refused Gorjo's request. No, we're... I'm not qualified to teach anyone. Toji frowned, regretting his spontaneous response. It was a mistake. He hadn't intended to give a sincere answer. Gorjo's six eyes sparkled. Heh, so that's the basics for someone at your level. Maybe. Toji honestly didn't know how his use of Haki compared. After all, in this world only Toji and Zoro knew about Haki. Zoro had never explicitly told him, your level of Haki is this. It was doubtful whether there was even a quantitative standard to measure the levels of Haki. All Zoro has ever said about my Haki was something like, it's somewhat decent now. What Toji knew was that his Haki was significantly lower than Zoro's, and that Zoro's Haki is near its peak. If there was a limit to how strong one could become with Haki, Toji believed Zoro's Haki would be touching that limit. Maybe except for Armament Haki, Zoro had mentioned that his observation Haki still had a long way to go. But, well if that's a long way to go, then what about my observation Haki? Is it just learning to walk? He remembered dueling with Zoro, who never missed a single movement of Toji's. There were times when his body, still young and slow, knew but couldn't dodge. But never a time when Zoro failed to perceive Toji's movements. Not even once. When Zoro's grey eyes filled with the thrill and joy of battle met with Toji's, there were times he couldn't help but get goosebumps. Despite knowing better than anyone that Zoro would never harm him, there was an urge to flee. It wasn't just about seeing with the eyes, but feeling as if the essence and information beyond were being fully exposed. Everything about Toji, his body, techniques, experiences, weapons, and even his potential. What exactly happened for him to reach that far? Still, it was incomprehensible. Anyway, Gorjo, you should continue refining your techniques. All. But I want to learn. Can't you at least tell me its name? No. It might be Toji's power. But Haki was also Zoro's power. The future is uncertain. Even though Gorjo and Zoro seem to get along now, they could become enemies later. Can it be guaranteed that Gorjo, having learned about Haki, wouldn't use that information to attack Zoro? There are no guarantees. Therefore, there was no way Toji would discuss Haki with Gorjo, even if it meant death. Of course, Zoro would say to speak up and save his own life. But that made Toji even less willing to speak. If I can't stand beside him, I should at least not hold him back. 
He was utterly insane. Toji chuckled to himself. But then, he had been abandoned since birth. He couldn't bring himself to put the one person who vowed never to abandon him in danger. Even more so since he was his son. Anyway, even if I taught him Haki, it wouldn't be easy for him to master. The better one's physical abilities, senses, energy, or other skills like techniques are, the harder it becomes to learn Haki. Instead of awakening Haki, one could simply rely on their other abilities. Toji himself had struggled to learn Haki for this reason. Not to mention Gorjo Satoru, who was born with the six eyes. Gorjo pouted and tapped his legs impatiently. So, you're saying you won't teach me? He never really expected Toji to willingly share. It's common for sorcerers to keep their trump cards secret and naturally, they don't want to share them with others. Especially if it's a power not even visible to my six eyes. It was a capability anyone would covet. Still, Toji had mentioned he wasn't at a level to teach anyone. Even if he didn't know the extent of that ability, what Toji had demonstrated in front of Gorjo suggested there was much more to it. Of course, a gorilla remains a gorilla. Even a basic level of that ability would be much more effectively used by others. The reason Marimo is strong, probably because that gorilla taught him that power. Gorjo seriously considered the exact opposite of the truth. Maybe if I press Marimo, I could get an answer. Like Toji, Zoro would know about that power. And since Zoro is Toji's son, perhaps harassing Zoro could make Toji open up. But Gorjo had no intention of going that far. A gorilla going berserk is one thing. His gaze drifted to Zoro, who had fallen asleep in the chair, embracing the children. Zoro mumbled in his sleep and hugged the kids tighter. Watching this, Gorjo thought, he's just a kid. A kid, a child, is always the weaker party in any society. And for the strong to bully the weak is something Sugoro strongly condemns and dissuades. Of course, Zoro wouldn't technically be considered weak when it comes to absolute strength. Suguru doesn't seem to know yet. It seems Suguru might even misunderstand that the incident with the special grade cursed spirit at the department store was handled by Toji. A laughable misconception. Zoro surely has power. Likely the same power that died Toji Black. However, even if such power existed, Zoro was still young. Younger than Gorjo Satoru when he first started on missions. Additionally, there's no need for him to be involved in the sorcery world. Yet he's been inadvertently caught up as a non-sorcerer. In that sense, Zen and Zoro was someone Gorjo Satoru needed to protect. Groaning, Gorjo scratched his white hair in frustration. The strong sacrificing for the weak is what makes a society right. All that sorcery exists to protect non-sorcerers. Such things, no matter how many times Gorjo heard them, never really resonated with him. He muttered to himself. Gorjo simply enjoyed using sorcery. He liked being strong and overwhelming. Being able to freely rampage and burst cursed spirits. Although he had saved people in the process, he didn't attach much importance to it. He wasn't a despicable human being or trash who delighted in seeing innocent people suffer. But he also couldn't genuinely empathize with the pain of the weak and get truly angry for them like Suguru did. However, he was well aware that a world where people like Suguru held power would be more peaceful and ideal. So, even though he retorted not to act all high and mighty every time Suguru nagged him, Gorjo faithfully followed his friend's ideals. Surely, it was the better choice. Well, can't be helped. He'd just have to leave Zoro alone and pester Gorilla Sensei to find out what that power was. Gorjo thought to himself, if I pester him all day, he might teach me out of annoyance eventually. In the past, such persistence might have been fatal. But now Gorjo had the reverse technique. Even with Toji's strange curse tool that could cancel techniques, Gorjo wouldn't be easily subdued like before. In other words, he had nothing to fear. Seeing Gorjo's sparkling six eyes through his sunglasses, Jito's eyes narrowed. That was the face he made when he was up to something. What's he plotting now? Jito mouthed the question. Nothing. Gorjo mouthed back with a sly grin. Can't really call a student asking their teacher questions a scheme, can you? Exactly. Gorjo nodded vigorously. Toji frowned, feeling an ominously bad premonition. With a feeling of unease, he declared. That's it for today's lesson. You okay? Be prepared, T-E-A-C-H-E-R tilde I'll stick to you until you teach me, without giving me a chance to not learn. Gorjo chuckled ominously, shoulders shaking. He he, he 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 What's wrong? Have you lost it? Satoru, what's with you? H tilde nothing. He he. Gorjo is weird, Sumiki, close your eyes. There's nothing good about seeing this. Toji scooped up the three huddled kids into his arms all at once. Sumiki and Megumi were sound asleep in the rest area in front of the vending machine at the Jujutsu High. The two had been drawing pictures together, proudly showing off their ability to write hiragana. And then, as if by agreement, they simultaneously nodded off into a deep sleep. It's true that young kids need a lot of sleep, but they seem to fall asleep quite often. Zoro was unaware that they had picked up this habit from him, who could sleep anywhere as soon as his head hit a surface. He laid the two comfortably on a long bench. Then, he picked up the papers on which they had been practicing hiragana. Zoro calmly reviewed the paper with Sumiki's name, DM, written in small, round hiragana characters. She missed the dot on O, J, again. It was a letter Sumiki frequently made mistakes with. Megumi's writing wasn't so much writing as it was drawing. Seeing Megumi's scribbled writing, Zoro chuckled to himself. The two strokes for I, D, were so close they almost looked like a U. And when writing Su, 
Why, instead of twisting the stroke once, it was twisted twice. It's not a spring. They were still young, so it was understandable. Who knows what they'll be like when they grow up, and if they're still silly well, that's fine too. Fools have their own path. The greatest fool of a captain and the former strongest swordsman in the world, who were about equal in their level of foolishness, would later look at Megumi, who managed to score a perfect 10 out of 10 in the Jujutsu High's theoretical sitting exams and think nothing of it. Sensing a presence, Zoro looked up. Toji had returned to the Jujutsu High after completing a mission, walking towards them with a cursed spirit weapon wrapped around his body. Father, nothing happened. No, Toji picked up a piece of paper fluttering near Zoro. Seeing the crooked writing, a faint smile appeared on Toji's lips. You've been checking their hiragana studies. Yeah, teach them a lot now. When they grow up, your siblings will be smarter than you. Huh, Zoro was quite knowledgeable and level-headed but not particularly intelligent. Usually, intelligent kids are the opposite. Toji silently sat next to Zoro, careful not to wake the children. Toji spread his observation haki to ensure Gorjo's presence was not nearby before asking Zoro, where's he? If you mean Satoru, he's out on a mission with Suguru. That's a relief. After Toji declared he would not teach Haki, Gorjo Satoru had been making excuses to stick around Toji incessantly, constantly asking questions and requesting additional lessons. He's planning to stick around until I teach him. An infuriated Toji once banned the use of techniques during physical training, and, with all his might through Gorjo, who had released his Limitless to the opposite side of the Jujutsu High. However, Gorjo was not the same as before. The moment he was thrown, he immediately applied the reverse curse technique to his entire body, recovering from all the damage he received while flying. Strictly speaking, the reverse curse technique isn't a technique, right? It's just one way of manipulating energy. Isn't that so? That was what Gorjo said when he showed up unharmed shortly after. Watching Gorjo, Toji for the first time understood what it felt like to be truly exasperated. I should throw him again. He was seriously tempted but gave up, knowing Gorjo would just use the reverse curse technique again. Since then, Toji used his observation haki to avoid Gorjo as much as possible. If it were about defeating him head on, that's one thing. Running away from Gorjo was something Toji could do. Of course, since Toji would return to his kids eventually, Gorjo would quickly find him again. The good thing was both Gorjo and Toji were very busy. As soon as the higher ups were informed that Gorjo had mastered the reverse curse technique, the level of his mission steadily increased. Therefore, Gorjo didn't have much time to follow Toji around. If the young master gets promoted to a special grade, the number of missions he and the front runner go out on together will decrease. It's inefficient to assign both a special grade and a grade 1 sorcerer to the same mission. They're dying to be apart from each other. Toji finished his thought. I wish it was a long-term mission. It's a simple one. They've been gone for a while, so they'll be back soon. Ugh. Guess I'll have to head to the next mission site right away. Seeing Toji's disgusted expression, Zoro said. If it bothers you that much, why not just tell him about Haki? Can't do that. Why? It's annoying. Of course. That wasn't the main reason, but Zoro wasn't great at understanding complex explanations, so it was easier to put it this way. Fortunately, Zoro accepted the explanation without much fuss. He is annoying, isn't he? You can't teach him Haki either. Why? He'll become even more annoying. Just for that reason. That's right. Zoro observed Toji, then smirked. That's not it. There's another reason. It's not entirely a lie. But the reason you don't want to teach Satoru Haki isn't just that. Toji clicked his tongue. Zoro was sharp. Faced with Zoro's expectant gaze, Toji had no choice but to speak. He's already too strong. If he becomes any stronger, then he might truly become an existence that even Zoro can't catch up to. I've already said too much about Haki to him. I'm not at a level to teach anyone. That meant there could be someone capable of learning and surpassing Toji in the use of Haki. He might have already realized that. Even if he's crazy, he's definitely not dumb. Zoro's grey eyes examined Toji for a moment before he laughed as if he had realized something. Are you afraid that if Satoru learns Haki, I'll never be able to beat him? Father, I'm going to be the strongest. And to become the strongest, naturally, he had to surpass Satoru as well. However, he had no intention of hindering Satoru's growth to achieve that. It would be a waste. To lose a good rival like that, people's growth isn't something you can just stop if you want to. In a previous life, those in power tried everything they could to halt the growth of the Straw Hat crew, mobilizing forces from all over the world. In the end, they all failed. I have no intention of becoming the strongest by belittling others, father. It might be your choice not to teach Satoru Haki, but that doesn't mean Zoro has a reason not to teach Satoru Haki. Well, even though I say that, I wonder if it would really be beneficial for Satoru to learn Haki. What do you mean? I'm honestly not sure what would happen if a sorcerer learned Haki. Energy, as we know, has a negative dash nature. The reverse curse technique generates positive plus energy by multiplying negative energy by negative energy. Ash, so, what about Haki? What kind of energy is Haki? Positive or negative? You don't know. I don't. In a previous life, there was no energy with a clear negative dash nature like curse energy. Unlike curse energy, which originates from negative emotions and has negative properties, Haki is derived from a strong will. 
This raises the question, does the will of living beings originate from positive or negative things? Can we even categorize human will as either positive or negative? Will is usually a mix of a person's emotions, beliefs, circumstances, and enlightenment. It's mostly impossible to pinpoint it as either positive or negative. If it's neither positive nor negative, then what is Haki? Currently, it's unknown. Toji and Zoro never used cursed energy in combat at all. There's also never been a sorcerer who learned or used Haki. Since we don't know the nature of Haki, we can't predict how it would interact with immense cursed energy. Perhaps for a sorcerer, learning Haki might be incredibly difficult. Or even if they learned it, Haki and cursed energy might cancel each other out, actually weakening the power of sorcery. In short, it might be better for sorcerers not to learn Haki. Toji muttered, having realized what Zoro was implying. I didn't feel a decrease in power when I used armament Haki on a tool. That's because you're flowing Haki into an already created tool. It might be different when a person directly generates both Haki and cursed energy. Besides, Toji has no cursed energy at all. Since Zoro, a non-sorcerer with a bit of cursed energy, uses Haki just fine. It's assumed that a sorcerer learning Haki wouldn't have a fatal effect. But it's uncertain since the difference in cursed energy between sorcerers and non-sorcerers is vast. Zoro thought, I should borrow a cursed tool from father and spar with him. It seemed like a good opportunity to truly experience the essence of cursed energy. Toji ruffled his hair, overwhelmed by the unexpected conversation. He hadn't even considered the impact of Haki's nature on sorcerers. Got it. I'll be back from the mission, so we'll talk in the evening Zoro, and Toji's heads turned in a certain direction. Someone had arrived. It was a strong presence. Toji pulled the handle of a cursed tool from the mouth of the storage cursed spirit he carried. Zoro, without making any particular movement, watched the hallway. The strong presence didn't seem hostile. Clack, clack. The sound of brisk footsteps approached. From the end of the Jujutsu High's corridor, a young woman appeared with long, blonde hair and a charming mole under her eye. She lit up upon seeing Toji. Hello Zen and Toji. Lucky me to meet you. Who are you? Sukumo Yuki, a special grade sorcerer. There was no need to add that title. Everyone in the Jujutsu High knew the name of the only existing special grade sorcerer, especially since she was infamous for abandoning her duties and wandering abroad. As if she hadn't noticed Toji's attempt to draw his weapon, she asked casually, What's your type in women? Toji chuckled dryly. Being asked about his preference in women as the first question upon meeting was neither appropriate nor pleasant. Had a man asked such a question at their first meeting, fists might have flown, but Toji, who tended to be quite gentle with women, asked for the reason behind it. Why do you ask that question? I believe that a person's sexual preference reflects everything about them. It was a thought fitting for a sorcerer. While I did ask about women, it doesn't really matter if it's men or anyone else. So, what's your preference? The image of a woman clearly formed in Toji's mind. In fact, it was a face that hadn't left his mind since he was first asked about his preference. She had petulant black hair and a smile like a piece of sunshine. He had never considered it as a preference, but he definitely couldn't say it wasn't his preference. Tanaka Chia was someone Zen and Toji couldn't help but love, in every way, from 1 to 10. So, if asked about his preference, the only response Toji could give was, she's gone now. Preference or whatever, the only woman he could love as a partner was Chia, and Chia was dead. Is that so? Unexpected. With that, Tsukumo no longer pursued Toji's preference. Then, glancing briefly at Zoro, she said to Toji, Zen and Toji, I have something to discuss with you. Shall we talk outside for a moment? Flatly rejected. At Tsukumo Yuki's suggestion to research the curseless phenomenon of a person with zero cursed energy, Zen and Toji displayed his displeasure and firmly refused. Well, it's not unexpected. It was natural for anyone, sorcerer or non-sorcerer, to dislike being experimented on with their body. So Tsukumo wasn't too disappointed. Clunk. Thud. A can of cola rolled out of the vending machine. She picked it up, opened it, and took a drink. Tsukumo's gaze shifted toward the corridor Toji had just left through. After rejecting her experiment proposal, Toji had reluctantly left, repeatedly glancing back at where Zoro was, clearly not wanting to leave. The menacing warning that he wouldn't let anything happen to the kids was a bonus. It's a pity. I wanted to talk more with him. Toji, the curseless phenomenon, had flatly rejected the experiment proposal and left, and the ones rumored to soon rise to special grade sorcerer status, Gojo and Jito, were also out on a mission. It might have seemed like a wasted trip to come all the way to the Jujutsu High. But Tsukumo didn't feel that way at all. I've met a remarkable child. She secretly smiled and turned back to Zoro. Do you want me to get you something too? Alcohol. Sorry, your father said he wouldn't let it slide if I did anything harmful to you guys. Besides, it's not like a school vending machine would sell alcohol. Instead of alcohol, Tsukumo picked out a can of orange juice and handed it to Zoro. He looked slightly disappointed but opened it and drank it down. She sat down beside Zoro, smiling at the sight of the children sleeping soundly. Is this one your sibling? Yeah. Cute. Especially the boy, who was the spitting image of Zen and Toji. Except for the spiky hair. Zen and Kun, what's your type in women? I don't have one. Zoro was indifferent to matters of sexuality, both in his past and present life. 
It wasn't out of aversion or bad feelings, he simply had no interest. Tsukumo tilted her head, uncertain whether he truly had no preference, or if he was too young to understand the question. So, she decided to ask a slightly different question. Is there anyone outside of your family or friends you want to meet? Someone you find interesting? Someone interesting? Zoro mentioned the first person that came to mind. A swordsman. A swordsman. Why? I want to fight them. Although Toji was quite skilled with a sword, he wasn't a swordsman. In this world, there were indeed people who wielded real swords but most could hardly be called swordsmen, due to their lack of skill, merely brigands at best. Tsukumo Yuki laughed heartily. That's interesting. I know a few sorcerers who use swords, should I introduce you? Are they swordsmen? Ah, no. More sorcerers than anything. Most use swords to channel curse energy or as a tool when they can't use techniques. The most swordsman-like sorcerer she could think of was probably Kusakib. Tsukumo murmured. Zoro turned his head away, showing disinterest. Never mind, then. Of course, being a sorcerer doesn't mean one can't be a swordsman. In his previous life, there were often swordsmen who also had devil fruit powers. But from Tsukumo's explanation, it seemed like their identity as sorcerers was much stronger than a swordsman. Their fighting style would be more focused on sorcery than swordsmanship. From Zoro's perspective, it was understandably disappointing. A world merely devoid of swordsmen. Sensing his feelings, she spoke calmly. Swordsmanship isn't looked down upon in the sorcery world. In fact, among sorcerers who use cursed tools, those who wield sword types are the most common. However, there's a limit to how strong you can become with swordsmanship alone. Not just for non-sorcerers, but also for sorcerers. It's because you can't infinitely strengthen a cursed tool with cursed energy. If too much is imbued, the tool can't withstand it and will break. You and your father are quite unique cases, Tsukumo added. It seemed like the ceiling for becoming stronger through swordsmanship in this world was much lower compared to his previous life. But isn't it the essence of a swordsman to cut through and leap over such limits? Insurmountable foes, bitter and desperate defeats, and the painful limits felt every time the path forward is blocked. Rorono as Zoro overcame all these hardships to finally reach the pinnacle as a swordsman. Zoro shook his head after a moment of thought. Not everyone can be like me. He had talent, continuously worked hard, and was also lucky. While effort is up to the individual, talent and luck are different matters. Even Kuina was frustrated that she was born a woman. If only I had been born a man. Stirring up old memories, Zoro's expression turned sullen. He was aware that people are born with different types and magnitudes of talents. Even if two people have the same talent and put in the same effort, it doesn't mean they'll achieve the same results. But still, I really hate it. The notions of wishing to have been born a man, saying that biological differences meant she couldn't beat him, that there are limits to how much physical strength or cursed energy can enhance a weapon. For Zoro, who lived his life without once making excuses for his defeats or weaknesses, all of it was nothing but excuses. Tsukumo chuckled at Zoro's grumpy face. You seem quite displeased. I really hate those kinds of excuses. Is that so? But many sorcerers make those excuses. Lacking in cursed energy, not inheriting powerful techniques, not being born into the Gorjo family, being from a non-sorcerer family with no knowledge of the sorcery world, encountering a strong cursed spirit too early in life. Many sorcerers voice their reasons for not becoming stronger as they fall behind and die. Tsukumo Yuki understood them. She knew all too well how shitty the fate you're born with can be. That's why she wanted to change it. Sending sorcerers to hunt cursed spirits as they appear that's the current policy of Jujutsu Hai. But I think there's a fundamental limit to that approach. All that does is pile up the ashes of exorcised cursed spirits and the corpses of sorcerers. Even though she was criticized for not fulfilling her duties as a special grade sorcerer, her focus on research activities abroad all had a reason. Tsukumo Yuki spoke earnestly. I don't want to hunt cursed spirits. I want to create a world where cursed spirits are not born at all. Zoro listened silently to her words. Do you think it's impossible? No. There's nothing impossible in this world. And Tsukumo Yuki seemed to sincerely believe in her goal and was making efforts to achieve it. Just as many pirates spoke of their dreams in his previous life. It's not polite to criticize someone else's dreams, no matter how absurd they might seem. Being someone who harbored dreams and ambitions as foolishly big and vast as Luffy's, Zoro had no intention of mocking or denying Tsukumo's dream. Tsukumo Yuki looked at Zoro with unfamiliar eyes. The upper echelons and other sorcerers, even Tenjin himself, had never seriously listened to her words. They gave half-pitying, half-dismissive responses as if her wish was. I want to pick stars from the sky looking at Tsukumo, as one would look at a child saying such a thing. Because Zoro took her ideal seriously, Tsukumo decided to give him a bit of a lesson. Cursed spirits are born when people feel negative emotions, and the cursed energy that flows out clumps together to form a shape. However, unlike non-sorcerers, sorcerers circulate cursed energy within their bodies, instead of emitting it externally. That's why sorcerers don't create cursed spirits. Of course, excluding cases where a sorcerer is killed by an attack not imbued with cursed energy, and transforms into a cursed spirit posthumously. So, there are two ways to create a world where cursed spirits aren't born. ZZZ, are you sleeping? Huh? Zoro, who had been nodding off, was startled awake by Tsukumo's nudge. Yawn. He didn't even try to hide that he had fallen asleep. Shameless. 
Instead of scolding him, she continued. Anyway, originally I thought of two ways to create a world without cursed spirits. First, remove cursed energy from all of humanity. Second, make all of humanity able to control cursed energy. Neither path is easy. Yet, she had a prime example right before her. The most promising clue is your father. Huh. Your father obtained superhuman physical abilities in exchange for being a curseless entity with zero cursed energy. Since he has no cursed energy at all, he can't create cursed spirits while alive. Despite searching the entire world, the only person like that both in the current era and throughout history was Zen and Toji. If all humans become like your father with zero cursed energy, the first scenario becomes possible. However, the major problem was that there's practically no way to transform non-sorcerers or sorcerers into curseless entities with zero cursed energy. And it's unknown under what conditions a curseless entity with zero cursed energy is born. None of Toji's sons are curseless entities with zero cursed energy, after all. My original goal was the second one, making all of humanity able to control cursed energy. And recently, I discovered an unexpected third possibility. What's that? You. Sukumo pointed straight at Zoro with her finger. Zenin Khan, you're still young and, most importantly, a non-sorcerer, yet you're incredibly strong. The rumor that a five-year-old non-sorcerer single-handedly defeated a special-grade cursed spirit was hard for even Sukumo to believe. But seeing it with her own eyes, she couldn't deny it. Zen and Zoro possessed that level of skill. He didn't seem to use techniques or cursed energy, but his sense as a special-grade sorcerer was on a completely different dimension from other sorcerers. You've already gotten rid of far more cursed spirits than you could ever produce in your lifetime. If all non-sorcerers could become like you, what do you think would happen? Sukumo asked, her eyes sparkling, before answering her own question. The rate at which cursed spirits disappear would far exceed the rate at which they are born. It wouldn't be a world where cursed spirits never arise, but it could be a splendid alternative. In that sense, Zoro, like Toji, was a subject of her research. Of course, researching Toji was one thing, but knowing Toji would become hostile, even seeing it as a threat if she suggested researching Zoro, she didn't mention it to Toji. Zoro frowned. He had a lot to say, but he asked the first question that came to mind. How are you going to do that? That's the problem. All three options were currently unrealistic. How about asking your dad to make another sibling? That's absurd, it's a joke. Sukumo chuckled, then clasped her hands behind her head. The joke wasn't entirely a joke, though. Sukumo was fascinated not only by Zen and Toji's curseless physique, but also by his genetic relations. Ironically, Zen and Toji, a man with absolutely no cursed energy, was born into the Zenin family, one of the three great sorcerer families in Japan. And all his children were born as beings capable of eradicating cursed spirits. The first child was a non-sorcerer with combat abilities to defeat cursed spirits, and the second child was a sorcerer. The Zenin family, among the Gorjo family, is famous for possessing a variety of inherited techniques. To secure and preserve inherited techniques, the Zenin family has been marrying sorcerers with various techniques into the family, and intermarrying within the family, to ensure their children inherit these techniques. Maybe being a curseless entity with zero cursed energy, is a mutant trait that emerged from the continuous interbreeding of sorcerers with techniques. Of course, it was just a hypothesis. Since Zenin Toji was the only known curseless entity with zero cursed energy throughout global history, there were limits to verification. Zenin Kun, do you know the basic principle of sorcery no of this world? It's equivalent exchange. As the number of non-sorcerers increases, so does the number of cursed spirits. When powerful sorcerers are born, powerful cursed spirits emerge as well. The same goes for constraints. The more you restrict, the more you gain. But you, you haven't lost much compared to what you have. Despite claims of abandoning duties or whatever, being a special grade sorcerer, it's undeniable. This child, although not a non-sorcerer or possessing zero cursed energy like a curseless vessel, has physical abilities comparable to those of zero cursed energy. Although Zoro's physical abilities are currently less than Toji's well, will that still be the case once he becomes an adult? Becoming stronger as a non-sorcerer doesn't mean the cursed spirit spirits will become stronger. Like Zen and Toji or other curseless vessels, he wasn't born with the constraints essential to life from the start. Yet, he has the potential to become even stronger than them. Thinking about it in terms of equivalent exchange, that was a very strange occurrence. You and your father are beings that escape the causality and laws of this world, Tsukumo Yuki define them that way? Toji was born without the cursed energy inherent in all humans, not confined by the yoke of cursed energy from the start. Zoro, although born within the yoke of cursed energy, was breaking and ignoring the fate that should have left him a significantly weak existence as a non-sorcerer, growing fearsomely instead. Zoro quietly pondered. Sukumo stood up, realizing it was about time to leave. Anyway, it was nice meeting you. Let's meet again in a few years. Not now, as fellow sorcerers. I'm not a sorcerer, though. Well, who knows? To her, Zoro seemed destined to remain within the sorcery world, an irregular capable of defeating special great cursed spirits at a young age, despite being a non-sorcerer. Because you were born that way, Sukumo smiled wistfully and turned away. See you again someday, Zenin Khan. As the woman's figure receded, Zoro, watching her golden head back, gently stroked the back of Tsumiki, 
who was tossing and turning as if dreaming. But you, you haven't lost much compared to what you have. Tsukumo's words kept echoing in Zoro's head. Really? Have I really not lost anything? Reincarnation. The ability to use cursed energy even after the world has changed. A body that can grow infinitely stronger with training and rapidly develop, despite not being a curseless vessel with zero cursed energy. All of that obtained without any cost. Something didn't add up. It was strange. If I have paid a price for all this what did I pay? Suddenly, a dream that Zoro no longer dreamed about flashed through his mind. More precisely, the red thread seen in that dream. When dreaming of the red thread and heart, although the thread was tied to Zoro's hand, it seemed like it could unravel or break it at any moment. Loose, thin, fragile. Yet, also beautiful and precious. Something he wanted to hold onto by any means. If it hadn't been for the gradually slowing heartbeat, perhaps he would have. Holding onto the thread might have caused the already fragile thread to snap. Zoro let go of the slowly unraveling red thread from his hand, and watched as it disappeared towards where he had left. Towards a place centered with the sea and illuminated by the sun. Whether it was a dream or a memory was unclear. If that was not merely a dream but a memory, was the red thread the price I paid? What exactly was that thread? What did I give up? 1564, 1565, 1566. Hurry. Hurry, brother, faster. 1567, 1568, 1569, 1570, 1571, 1572. Mei Mei, having completed her mission and returned to the school, stopped in her tracks at the sight of a rare scene. Well, a young man with green hair, shirtless, lifting and lowering a giant basket with two small children inside, performing exercises was indeed a sight one wouldn't see just anywhere. Kaya. More, more. The children inside the basket didn't stay still. They bounced around. Seeing Zoro lifting and lowering the wildly shaking basket quickly and steadily, Mei Mei cracked a smile. Even a slight imbalance would tilt the basket. And the kids inside aren't staying still either. Zoro subtly adjusted his grip on the basket, shifting the center of gravity, while continuing his play and exercise routine. Drip, drip. Mei Mei noticed countless sweat droplets falling every time Zoro moved. It's mid-December. Moreover, the school's location in the mountains made it colder than the city. Today was exceptionally cold as well. On such a day, especially in a place colder than most, how long and how intensely would one need to exercise for their shirt to become soaked with sweat? Mei Mei casually asks Zoro, aren't you cold? Zoro glanced at Mei Mei. Unlike Gojo, Jito, or Shoko, with whom he often interacted, Zoro didn't have much to do with Mei Mei. They had only seen each other's faces in passing a few times. Not really. You're working harder than usual, Zeninkan. Something on your mind? Not sure. 1603, 1604, 1605. Zoro counted internally, responding nonchalantly. After Tsukumo's visit, Zoro had thought about the dream involving a heart and red threads. He also considered the possibility that the dream wasn't merely a dream, but a real memory that Zoro had experienced at some point. If it was a real memory, two questions arose. One was what the red thread Zoro had given up represented. The second was when exactly he had experienced that event. Wondering if there might be something he missed, Zoro reflected on his experiences across two lifetimes. Whether it was my first life or my second, there's no particular gap in my memories while I was alive. All memories were intact within Zoro's mind, of course. It wasn't that he remembered everything without fail. Naturally, some memories faded over time, but there was no unnatural void. The only time I might not remember is when I was very young in my first life. But lacking memories from infancy is quite natural, unless it was about his second birth. Where he was reborn as an adult, almost no one retains memories from when they were actual infants. If there was a void after death, did he dip his toes in hell? Zoro thought for a moment, but then shook his head. Hell wasn't that dark. Trying to recall the circumstances before and after that memory proved impossible, as if trying to cram something much larger into a tiny box. One thing was certain, he did not regret letting go of the thread at that moment. Then, as now, that's enough. It was only giving him a headache. If it's something I need to know, I'll find out eventually. Zoro carefully set down the basket and put his shirt back on. Megumi's eyes sparkled. Maul. Maul. No Megumi. Brother is tired. I'm not tired. Don't show off. When did you learn to say that? From Mr. Gorjo. That guy, really Tsumiki chuckled and then suddenly asked. Do you feel better now? Zoro looked thoughtfully at Tsumiki. Why do you ask? You seemed upset. Tsumiki gently rubbed between Zoro's eyebrows. To others, he might have appeared as his usual expressionless self but she could tell the difference. Earlier, Zoro had been in a particularly bad mood. Lifting heavy things and sweating a lot makes me feel better. He explained, though Sumiki still didn't understand why. Was it because his body warmed up in the cold? But then, he would take off his top when it got too warm. Yet, if it made Zoro happy, Sumiki was happy too. The basket is fun. Seeing Sumiki's bright smile, Zoro couldn't help but smile faintly himself. Megumi clung to Zoro's arm, whining for more. Ah, right. 
I want to swing a long sword. One that can reach all the way over there. Why? So it can reach far. Zoro chuckled at the childlike logic. A short sword can reach far too. In his previous life, Mihik had used a fork-sized sword, or even smaller, to unleash massive slashes. A skilled swordsman didn't need a large sword to reach far. Really? Yes. Then maybe I'll use a short one. Up to you. Doing what one desires is the best. Zoro, echoing the sentiments of a true pirate, gently patted Tsumiki's head. Higher! Higher! Yielding to Megumi's demands, Zoro lifted his onto his shoulders for a piggyback ride. With his eye level significantly elevated, Megumi, forgetting his tantrum, hugged the back of Zoro's head and giggled happily. I love you. Me too. Cradling Megumi, who buried his face in his green hair, Zoro also expressed his affection for Tsumiki. And you too. Tsumiki's brown eyes widened, then softened. I love you too, brother. I know. It's important to say it even if you know. It's nice to hear. Idiots don't understand unless you say it. Are you talking about me? You're not that kind of idiot. Hum. But you are an idiot at other times. Teasing me. Zoro playfully tousled Tsumiki's hair. Tsumiki stretched her arms wide. Hug me. With an exasperated look, Zoro warmly embraced Tsumiki. Mei Mei commented, so affectionate. They're the ones who always come to me. Uh-huh. Sure, being young doesn't mean being utterly clueless. Initially, they might approach, but they wouldn't keep clinging to someone they thought wouldn't accept them. The fact they freely ask for hugs suggests they've been readily given them before, quite frequently at that. After completing a mission, Gorjo and Jito arrived with their hands full of snacks. Each had a skewer of dango, Japanese dumplings, in their mouths already. Seeing the kids clinging to Zoro, Gorjo grimaced. They're at it again. Hello, Mei Mei, greeted Jito. Hi, Jito-kun. What's that in your hand? We passed by a famous dango place on our way here. Bought some. Gorjo looked around and asked, Hey Marimo, where's your dad? Not sure. Hum, must have gone on a mission. Guessing correctly, Gorjo tossed his finished dango skewer onto the ground. Too bad. I wanted to spar. The class 1 spirit he had just defeated was too easy. Gorjo stopped himself from saying more, knowing the response wouldn't be favorable. For Gorjo now, class 1 spirits weren't much of a threat. He needed at least a special grade to exert himself. But those weren't common, and as a class 1 sorcerer, he rarely encountered them. Blasting spirits away with my newly learned purple technique is fun at first. But that soon became boring. Essentially, recent missions felt like outings with Satoru. Though, the dango today was delicious. Gorjo preferred dango with lots of sweet red bean paste, but the mitarashi. Sweet soy sauce, dango from that shop was exceptionally good. Satoru liked the ones coated in soybean flour. Zoro glanced at Gorjo setting down a shopping bag, and asked in a very calm tone. It was boring. Sort of, I guess. Gorjo blinked, surprised. It was the first time someone openly asked if he found fighting boring. Cheeto set down his shopping bag and admonished softly, Zoro, fighting isn't for fun. It's to protect the weak. What if the opponent is weak? Then you shouldn't fight at all. If there's wrongdoing, punishment should follow the law, not violence. Seeking meaningless fights only harms the weak in the face of stronger aggression. A society where the strong sacrifice for the weak is the ideal. Jito concluded with a slight smile. Satoru made a groaning noise, even lecturing a kid about positioning. Satoru. It's important to teach them while they're young. They don't yet fully understand right and wrong. Ugh, total old man T-A-L-K tilde. Haha, <laughs> Satoru. Jito grabbed Gorjo by the collar, only smiling with his eyes. Gorjo, with his physical restraints lifted at the collar. Laughed, you can't hit me, can you? Watching Jito effortlessly lift Gorjo off the ground with a clean motion, Zoro chuckled. The right society. Huh? In his previous life, Zoro was a notorious pirate who caused upheaval across the world, ultimately leading to its collapse. Discussing the rightness of society wasn't exactly a conversation meant for him. Sorry, Jito. But I don't fight based on those standards. If there's someone to fight, whether they're strong or weak, alone or in a group, whoever they are, I'll fight. I won't get hurt. I won't. Even if Satori throws me a hundred times, not a speck of dust would land on me. Huh. Guess we'll see if that's true if I actually do it a hundred times. Hey, no spinning. Who spins someone around while throwing them? Who announces their moves in advance if they're not stupid, Satoru? Alright, going for ten more rounds. I surrender. I surrender. As Zoro watched Jito spin Gorjo around, he kept his thoughts to himself, seeing that neither seemed inclined to listen to anyone else at the moment. Mei Mei had left at some point, and Megumi and Tsumiki were engrossed in their own game holding hands. Maybe it's time for some training, Zoro thought, but then he sensed someone approaching. It was his father, Toji, returning from a mission, silently coming up behind him. Father, were you watching a fight? Fun. Watching isn't fun. Fighting is where the fun's at. Usually, people enjoy watching fights, don't they? Toji thought for a moment, but then remembered neither he nor Zoro was exactly normal. Just make sure you don't get caught by someone who can scold you. 
like the police, or a teacher, who would scold me? Well, I can't, that's for sure. The only person who could really scold Zoro was Tsumiki, mainly when he wandered off on his own and got lost. Toji whistled at Jido's actions. Your physical skills have improved a lot. Well, after getting beaten up by me that much and not improving would be idiotic. Toji looked pleased, watching Jito swing Gorjo around like a club. Well done, Jito. Keep it up. Father, are you tired now? No. Then lend me a sword, as a cursed tool. Why? I want to find something out. Thinking might clear his head, and he felt restless after being relatively calm lately. Guessing what Zoro was planning, Toji chuckled. Why was he asking if he was tired? Alone. Having someone to spar with would be ideal. You're planning to beat up your newly returned dad. You said you weren't tired. But Toji had been quite busy with missions lately. Zoro glanced at Gorjo and Jito and pointed in their direction. Then, how about with those guys? What? Gorjo, still dizzy from being spun around, asked. Jito released Gorjo's collar and turned to Zoro. What are you talking about, Zoro? You're out, I was thinking of sparring. Before Toji could intervene, Zoro made his intention clear. Both Gorjo and Jito stopped and looked down at Zoro. This could get complicated, Toji thought, pressing the bridge of his nose. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.